Could I have all the board members to their seats, please? Before we start the work session, we need to uh, certify uh, the closed meeting. In order to comply with the section 2.23712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for all to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened the closed meeting on May 29, 2014, to the best of its members' knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Is there a motion? Moved by Ms. Hines and seconded by Mr. Strauss. All those in favor, raise your hand. The vote is <laughs> unanimous with a Mr. Stork present. Thank you. Besides, all yours. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Moon. This is a great night for us, one of, um, one of a few that we have coming up right now, and we get to hear from our advisory committees, and we are so very grateful to all of you for the work that you do. Um, the way that we'll do this is I will ask the five committees that are reporting tonight for, well, we have Title I, don't we have five? Three. Four. 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 Okay, I, I apologize. Um, I, hang on just a second. I apologize, we have four, um, four committees that we'll be reporting. I will ask um, all four committees to send representatives up to the end of the table here. Um, so it may be that we only can have the chair of the committee up here at the end of the table. Um, and uh, there, there might be room for an extra person um, Possibly. Um, anyway, and then what we'll do is we'll ask each committee to uh, deliver your report. If you can keep it to 20 minutes, that would be great. And then after all four reports have been um, given to us, the board members will ask questions of everyone. Um, so um, if we could have representatives from the Human Relations Advisory Committee, the School Health Advisory Committee, the Early Head Start and FESEP Committee, and the T Title I District Advisory Council come to the head of the table, please. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, I, I think what I'd like to do is to just ask, um, st starting uh, over here with Chris, if you could just um, each introduce yourself before we begin, um, uh, and then after you each introduce yourselves, we will begin with the Human Relations Advisory Committee. So Chris, if you would start. Sure. My name's Chris Gare. I'm the chair of the School Health Advisory Committee. Karen Acox, the Title I Family Engagement Resource Teacher, Staff Liaison to the District Advisory Council. Hi. Shana Mask, uh, Chair of the FESEP Head Start Parent Policy Committee. Good evening. Mark Penn, I'm one of the chairs for the Human Relations Advisory Committee. Vince Brino, co-chair of the HRAC. Great, okay, thank you. And you already figured out you need to touch, push the button and let the little green light come on. When you finish talking, if you would push the button again and let the light go off, I think that helps with the sound. Um, okay, well, let's start right in. The Human Relations Advisory Committee, if you'd like to start. Yes, good evening. I want to first say thank you to the Human uh, Relations Advisory Committee members that are here. Thank you for your, your work this year and for the support that you give us to uh, the staff at EER that also supports us. Uh, the charge that we had for this particular year uh, was a very challenging charge. It was, it was a broad charge. It was, it was to consider the consideration of the diverse student needs of the diverse population within Fairfax County Public Schools. Now, as you know, our, our school system is huge, and when you look at diversity, that's a very, very broad topic. So we spent, uh, we spent the first several months just looking at the charge, defining diversity, and looking at some of the specific, uh, specific areas in which we could really focus the charge. We, we then had different folks from FCPS, um, from the different offices to come and to share information with us regarding uh, Fairfax County and its diversity. We looked at several different areas. Um, we, we narrowed it down to three in particular. We wanted to look at uh, what is the diversity of FCPS as it relates to the 21st century um, learning, uh, 21st century learning. The second uh, part of the second tier to our charge really had to do with the diverse needs, and we wanted to look at that from, from 
multiple angel angles, not just age, not just color, uh, that, that kind of thing. But we also wanted to look at uh, levels of, of learning. We wanted to look at levels of program. We wanted to look at the different kinds of students that we had. We wanted to look at some of the issues that, uh, diverse issues that face um, our students in uh, Fairfax County Public Schools. So we had, and then the third tier had to do with communication, had to do with communication. As a system as broad as our system, communications is always an issue. It's always something that we need to take a look at. So uh, let, let's just take a look at, first looking at the 21st century learning model, and it's, it's the four C's, as we all know. It has to do with collaboration, uh, creativity, um, critical thinking, and communications. And we wanted to look at these particular, um, these particular uh, ideas as it relates to the diversity within uh, Fairfax County Public Schools. What does 21st century learning look like for an IB student? What does it look like for a, an AP student? What does it look like for an ELL student? What does it look like for a student uh, with disabilities? So we wanted to try to take a look at, at how we could uh, how we could focus, how we could focus that. The, the other area was the, uh, the second area had to do with the diversity, the student diversity, or the student diverse needs. And as you know, um, Fairfax County has many, many students, and with that comes a lot of, of looking and exploring and considering because the, the needs are are that diverse because of the many cultures, the many countries, the many languages, uh, the different student needs uh, uh, that that make up Fairfax County. It's it is absolutely a daunting task to try to focus or form. Uh, programs around uh, the diverse needs of Fairfax County. We looked at we looked at Thomas Jefferson. We considered AAP. We considered AP. We considered uh, students with disabilities. We considered students in, in poverty. We considered students that are, are uh, ESOL or ELL students. We looked at students who might be on an uh, on an IB track, but we also looked at students who who wanted something a little different. Uh, we looked at CTE. We looked at what are our academy, what are our, our academy um, programs, how, how, does, uh, how does students enroll in those programs, how is, uh, is being an IB student, for example, if you're an IB student, but you decide you want to take a course at one of the academies in nursing, how does that fit in when the requirements for graduation are so lofty for an IB student? So we, we, we looked at that as well. We looked at the, the many different languages. I know one of the, uh, one of the uh, months we had uh, uh, folks to come in, and I, I want to pull that. It's um, uh, and I know she she's here this evening to look at the very to look at the programs that uh, Fairfax County has in place for specific uh, diverse needs of students, and so we looked at that as well. Um, and then we we wanted to uh, the the 21st century learning, and then we wanted to look at the diversity or the diverse needs of the students, probably all of those are equally, equally um, important, but probably the biggest challenge that we faced as a committee when we were considering um, this charge, the diverse, uh, the, the, the diverse student needs of a diverse population is communication. Communication really in, in our opinion, poses uh, a great challenge. And I think that, or we think that, because Fairfax County is so good, it's so large, it's so big, it's so bulky, that we sort of throw, and I'm, that's my turn, we sort of throw everything we can think of to try to communicate, to try to relate to parents, to try to get them involved, to try to um, to try to uh, disseminate information, uh, to make folks aware of the many many programs that we do have. But by doing that, 
it almost encumbers or makes the process that much more difficult because how do you navigate such a large system and so much information? Even for those of us that are employees who have been working for in the system for a long time, it still poses a problem in trying to communicate. Oh, I didn't know we had that program. Did you know you could you could contact the website and find this out? I didn't know that was there. Well, if if it's if it's difficult for those of us that work in the system, how much? how more difficult it is for people that are, are new to our country. They don't understand how the system works. They don't know how to navigate the system. So we were trying to, to figure out what, just where are our communication issues? Where do they lie? Just because information is being given doesn't mean that information is being received. And if information is not being received, then therefore can we, can we honestly say that we are communicating. And so that was, th those are the three areas in which we uh, focused our, our, our charge and wanted to come up with some actionable recommendations or at least some ideas for you all to consider as we move forward. We also, we also noted that, that when we started this year's charge, we, we figured that it would not be a one-year charge. It wasn't something that we could take a look at once and then drop and, and move to the side. So in our minds, we're looking at possibly uh, this being a two-year charge or possibly even, even longer as we begin to look at some of the details to some of these areas in which we were able to uncover. So we came up with some actionable recommendations um, and if you, you, I know you read the report and they are there. I just want to sort of highlight or go through them quickly. Uh, the, first, uh, the first recommendation or the first item we want you to think about is how are we, uh, how can we better enhance our communications within our system because it is so large? And we were thinking, um, we were thinking that possibly uh, is there a way to come up with some sort of a fact sheet or a one-page data sheet that sort of outlines the programs, uh, many of the programs that uh, encompass Fairfax County Public Schools so that, so that parents and teachers and staff might, might have a quick, a, a, a cheat sheet, if you will, to, to, to sort of know where uh, particular things are in, where, where specific things are in particular, so that you, you're not overwhelmed trying to find an answer to your question. It's one thing to have a question, it's another thing to sort of know where to go to even begin to get that question answered. So that was one of the recommendations that we, that we looked at. And uh, the, the second uh, recommendation has, has to do with, um, with, with the number of programs that we offer and coming up with or at least looking into ways in which we can streamline um, the programs that we offer and to put them in some sort of a format where it becomes, where it becomes easier for folks to navigate the system. Now I know that from, from, uh, you know, from my time on MSAOC, I, and I do know, I know about the, the advocacy handbook, and that's, you know, that's something that I'm, I know everyone's aware of, but I know that over time, uh, you know, that particular document possibly has not been utilized to the extent that it could be, and so that, you know, I just mentioned that as well, uh, because we need to find a way to, to take what we have, which is much, which is a lot, which is expansive, and find a way so that our parents might, be, uh, specifically our parents, might be able to utilize um, the things that we're offering and be able to put it in a way where it's palatable and they could understand it in layman terms. And might I also add that we are very, very good at, we have every acronym and every kind of educational jargon that there is, but to find a way to really simplify that. We also thought about um, possibly, since we are in an age of technology and there's technology everywhere, uh, is, is looking at possibly some ways to 
um, to evaluate our search engine engines in terms of of looking at some different options to make it easier for folks to be able to navigate the website. And also, I want to add to that, and as you all know, part of another piece to the issue there is equal access. And we know that that is absolutely huge because having, having um, a lot of technology doesn't mean anything if folks do not have access to it, okay? And then uh, we, we also wanted to, and I, this is a piggy, this is sort of a piggyback from our work from last year. Um, we spent a lot of time last year, as you all know, looking specifically at the work of our parent liaisons. And you know this is an this is an area in which uh, our parent liaisons can be invaluable. Their work is invaluable to help us to take the information to the specific communities, so that we might be able to bridge to bridge some of the gaps that we have, so that the communication and the parent involvement is is more aligned, more in sync, and it, it also is is much smoother. And so we wanted to try to at least put that out on the table again. Is to is to consider and reconsider the work of the liaisons and how invaluable their work is in um, going out into the communities. And then the last thing that I'll say, um, and Vince, you can add something if you like. The last thing I would like to say is I, I personally, and this is my 20th year in FCPS, am a proponent for CTE. Um, I, I personally don't think we utilize the programs that we have to the extent that we could. When students take, take uh, CTE courses, they, they take tests and they are licensed. They receive a license to practice um, you know, in, in that particular area. And I don't, I, you know, I don't think we really utilize that, those resources to the extent that we could. I, it's a, to me, it's a diamond in the rough. And so one of the things that we, we talked about is because every school sort of tailors how they use their CTE and academy programs. But to, but to help parents to understand and be, able to, and to be able to communicate or articulate to their children some of those offerings, we need to look at some of the very specific courses in which we, th that we do offer and how that is, how that is communicated online. So these are, these are our, our recommendations to you and we appreciate your time. Uh, we certainly appreciate the charge that we had this year looking at the diverse student needs of a diverse population. And I don't know any place anywhere that has the kind of diversity that we have. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, wonderful. And again, board members, I hope you've been writing down your thoughts and questions because we will be back. <laughs> but thank you so much for that and for all your work. Um, next is um, School Health Advisory Committee annual report. Hi, I'm Chris again. And um, would like to thank the, the school board for uh, the charge that we received and also for keeping this committee alive. It's one that is no longer required um, by the Code of Virginia. Um, but it is obviously a very important issue um, uh, here locally and, and nationally, so we're, we're glad we could continue to, uh, to provide some recommendations to the board. Um, our charge for this year was to um, develop recommendations for a comprehensive wellness policy and also to look at a, um, a concept <coughs> called medical home to schools concept. I'll explain what that, what that is a little later. Um, so. Our objective, our goal was really to not just provide a recommendation, but actually write the policy language uh, as best as we could in, in the style or format um, uh, to give to you. So there might be something in there that you would, uh, you would like and uh, might want to keep, and, and hopefully maybe we could have done some of the work for you. Um, the policy... Um, uh, is supplemented by regulations, and the, the, everything that, that you have here uh, with the school board is done that way. Um, when, the, when the federal government and the state talk about policy requirements, they don't get into the details of whether those requirements should be um, uh, put forth in policies or regulations or how local uh, authorities are going to legislate that. So we, we completed the comprehensive wellness policy 
for you, and that's included at the at the back of this uh, report. And then we also took on um, creating individual regulations. So the individual regulations and the requirements that the federal government wants to see, um, again, when they talk about it, they just talk about it as the policy requirements. But in Fairfax County, they're actually regulations. Um, we were charged with using the CDC's coordinated school health model uh, as framework for the wellness policy recommendations. Um, the CDC breaks school health and wellness into eight categories to, to help local districts look at um, everything that could be a component of, of school health. Um, they are health education, physical education, health services, healthy and safe school environment, health promotion for staff, family and community involvement, nutrition education, um, and counseling, psychological, and social services. Um, other districts around the country are using the CDC's model, not just for wellness policies, but for an even larger overarching approach to uh, school health and wellness. Um, this was a good time to uh, approach this and for, and for this charge because there are new federal uh, requirements that were legislated in the 2010 Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act. Um, and specifically for wellness policies for local districts. Um, that legislation has been in effect since, since 2010, but the USDA is in the process of finalizing their um, uh, final ruling and interpretation of the law. Um, the USDA has been issuing guidance um, on the legislation all the way through to help school districts move forward doing something. And the proposed rule um, has been written. It went up for public comment. And there is no date as of yet that they've published as to when the final rule will, will be issued. But it's right around the corner. So in one way, we're ahead of the game because the, the final ruling from the USDA has not been set forth. Um, um, but there are other districts that have already finalized their enhanced wellness policies and have looked forward even a little further. Um, and even since we started, since the committee began until now, I've noticed many more local districts that have greatly enhanced their, their wellness policies. Um, we had a great committee. We had representation from uh, the County uh, Board of Health, from health practitioners, doctors, physicians, psychologists, nurses. Um, uh, we had a, a, a great student representative who, who's here today, Ben Press, helped us a lot. Um, so I, I, probably the best thing to do would be to look at, I'd like to look at the, um, the actual wellness policy and the regulations, which are towards the end of the report in Appendix A. And that's really the, 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 the recommendation that we've given is we've written the policy and about half of the regulations that come under the CDC's suggested eight components. Um, I don't know if you want to scroll down to Appendix A. Yeah, there it is. So we currently have a wellness policy. Um, it was required that all school districts um, have a wellness policy uh, under 2004 federal legislation. So we've had one in place. Um, and the new requirements um, are really just enhancing, um, enhancing what, what, what should be in there. And the majority of the, of the, of the new requirements are really surrounding um, public engagement accountability, um, um, and then also outline spe specific goals that must be in the policy, like nutrition promotion, education, physical activity. Um, there are requirements for annual assessments. Um, the public must be made aware of updates, um, there's a requirement for monitoring and oversight, which would most likely be uh, fulfilled by the, by the state. Um, so we wrote a policy that, that um, 
places the health and wellness of our students, staff, and school communities at a level of importance no less than what we set for academic achievement or any that we uphold in our missions, in our belief, mission, and vision. Declares credence to the proven correlation between the health and wellness of our students and their academic su success and the reciprocal effect of education as a primary determinant to healthy living. And I think that's one of the most important things that we, we came up with is that it's not just about uh, improving school and student health and its effects on, on their performance, but better educated students and citizens are going to be healthier. So it's, 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 um, so we approached f uh, four out of the eight categories that the CDC suggests be part of a wellness policy. Um, the four that we, if you could, I guess, scroll down a couple more pages to the regulation. Yeah, and that's just an introduction to the policy. Um, we approached and gave recommendations for regulations surrounding um, health education, health services, physical education, and we actually broke physical education out into physical education and physical activity. And then we put forth um, some, but maybe not all, of uh, the recommendations for um, healthy and safe school environment. Um, what we've put forth for the regulations, the committee feels are strong and solid and complete. Um, other than the healthy and safe school environment, we, we felt there was more that could be added to, to that part of the, the regulations. Um, the components of the wellness policy that we didn't approach were health promotion for staff, uh, counseling, psychological, and social services. And th those two, there were kind of midstream events that happened, unexpected deaths, deaths uh, student deaths, uh, and then also for the health promotion for staff, there's a, been a uh, administration-led uh, staff wellness initiative. So, um, and then two others that we did not include yet were um, nutrition, education, and food services, and family and community involvement. And we just needed to tie those up and, and put forth the absolute most solid recommendation we could. Um, the, fe the, federal the federal regulations um, require um, let me see. Well, let me, I guess let me just go back to the first, I'll go back to the first few pages, which kind of give an outline of, of some of this stuff. Um, so the wellness policy, that was the bulk of our work, that's there. Also, the regulations that we put forth. Um, what we'd like to do for next year is finish quickly the other um, recommendations for the, for the regulations. Um, we uh, certainly approached the issue of depression, suicide, and mental health on its own. We had a student representative from Langley High School address the group. We spent uh, probably at least two solid meetings um, uh, on that subject. Um, the medical home to schools concept is a concept and that was part of our charge was to explore this medical home to schools concept is a concept that's initiated and driven by the medical community. So it's, it's basically a concept that harkens back to a family doctor that would see your care through, you know, through your youth and, you know, for, for, for uh, your entire life perhaps. So with the recent changes in, in health care um, legislation, um, this is something that, that our medical community representatives on the committee explained that this was, this was happening um, uh, more often. The doctors are taking a, a, a more long, a, a more involved um, singular role in, in, in patients. Um, and so what would that mean for the, the school community? How could we um, benefit from or assist? Um, and it's really communication uh, is... is about the only thing that could help the this initiative, which is driven by the medical community. So we just we just thought to encourage awareness of this concept, there could be individual schools or school communities that could help 
the medical community facilitate communications with schools when needed. That's all. Um, and we included that in one of the regulation su suggestions. Um, we did have a, a group approach the committee. Um, so we, we did write a recommendation based on, on what they came to us, uh, the concerns that they came to us with. The Unified uh, Prevention Coalition of Fairfax County came to us. Uh, they do great work. They actually used to be somehow an agent or an arm of the school system. Um, they have a grant uh, uh, to support um, work they're doing um, with, with uh, pediatricians. Um, and they're not, I guess, getting the success as quickly as, as they would like, so we just recommended that they continue to um, be able to use the, the support and partnership, which they already have with the school system, to help facilitate their work. Um, a comprehensive tobacco-free policy is included in the, in the regulation language. That's something that Jack has, has given a recommendation on for many years. Um, we continue to support developing and maintaining the most comprehensive tobacco policy allowed by law. Um, a few years ago, the State Department of Health issued a report on uh, local school districts in the Commonwealth and assessed all of their uh, tobacco policies. Um, there, are, there are other districts within the Commonwealth that have absolutely comprehensive policies that, that prohibit at any time, any place, anywhere, by anyone, before, during, or after school on holidays or weekends. So it was interesting to read some of these other districts doing more, some doing less, and some doing, you know, obviously somewhere in the middle. Um, what else? Um, We had, um, we had good attendance. Uh, we actually added a meeting this year. We added a meeting in December when a lot of committees don't typically meet, um, which I think showed the, the support of, of everyone on the committee. Um, we had even one member added because they requested to join the committee, and that was a representative from the High School Principals Association. So we had um, representatives from high school, middle school, and elementary school principals associations. Um, and that may be about it, but the, the bulk of what we, of our work is contained in, that, in the policy and the regulations that are at the back of the report. Um, I, don't, I don't feel a need to go through, <laughs> to go through them. There's a lot in there, um, but again, under the categories of, of physical education, physical ac activity, um, health education, healthy and safe school environment, and um, for next year, we would like to finish up the other categories um, that the CDC recommends. And we also, we also thought that because community involvement and public participation is a major new requirement under the federal legislation for wellness policies, that Shaq has already served this role and could, could certainly serve the role into, in, into the future. Um, it makes sense. We have representatives from, from throughout the community, and, and um, so we could assist in, in being that vehicle to provide public input and engagement, which is now required by, by, by federal law. Um, I, think that's, I think that's about it. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we'll have questions, so. Um, um, Thank you. And so next up is um, uh, Early Head Start Family and Early Childhood Education Program Head Start Policy Committee Annual Report. Good evening. Again, I'm Shana Mask, um, and I'm the chair of the FISAF Head Start Policy Committee. Uh, of course, I want to thank you for your support of this program and for the opportunity, uh, uh, excuse me, for the opportunity to speak this evening on behalf of the program and the parents involved. Um, I, of course, I'm sorry, what's going on? Oh, okay. Got it. Gotcha. I, of course, am a parent. Is that better? Yes? Great. Um, I'm a parent as well. My son attends the Head Start classroom at Fair Hill Elementary in Fairfax. 
Um, I'm very excited to share some some information about the program and, and as it relates to my family specifically, but first I'll go ahead and um, highlight some of the accomplishments of the Head Start program for the 2013-2014 school year. Um, for those unfamiliar with the program, the Family and Early Childhood Education Program, FESEP, Head Start and Early Head Start, um, they involve income eligible families, community volunteers, public and private organizations, and program staff to address the educational, emotional, social, and health needs of children ages six weeks through four years. The program is currently funded to serve 1,475 children ages three and four in over 65 classrooms located in elementary schools, secondary schools, and the Graham Road Community Building. Um, Early Head Start has 48 infants, toddlers, and expect expectant, excuse me, mothers enrolled. This year, the FESEP Head Start program opened eight additional classrooms and continues to grow to meet the needs of over 1,395 children on the Fairfax County Office for Children wait list, 908 of which are on the Fairfax, on the FCPS wait list as well. We also have uh, just gotten word that two more additional classrooms will be available next year thanks to your decision last week. Thank you for that. Um, so we, excuse me, there is data collected, longitudinal data collected um, on the students that have been previously enrolled in the FESEP Head Start program and even early Head Start. And it's continually assessed as they progress through Fairfax County public school system. The standard of learning assessment data shows that a larger percent of these former students consistently meet or exceed their grade level reading and math expectations when compared to other students who qualify for free or reduced lunch but have not attended any Head Start or early Head Start programs. I strongly believe that this is a direct reflection of Head Start and early Head Start programs ongoing commitment to parent engagement and community involvement and the constant search for new and innovative ways to engage and support families in their child's learning and development. It's a natural want for your children to do well and for them to have a good life and opportunities that you did not have. And I mean, there's, it's, they nurture that. They nurture that want for parents to have for their children. And they're constantly looking for recommendations and new ways to engage the parents. And that is amazing. <laughs> This year, the advisory committee charge was to build family engagement in their children's education and to foster closer working relationships between the families and school partners throughout the children's academic careers. In the fall, parents were surveyed to self-assess their comfort level and capacity for supporting their child's school readiness. Question topics ranged from the level of confidence parents had in promoting curiosity and problem solving to how many times a week that they read to their children. Parents will be surveyed again in June, and the data compiled will be used to assess the effectiveness of the opportunities offered to the families. Um, some of the opportunities are family workshops on child development, literacy, budgeting, conferences with the teachers and parents, and family breakfasts held at the individual schools. That is a personal favorite of my son. He was very excited to have me there um, and, and see what he had accomplished throughout the year. Um, the parents also had multiple, occasion, or multiple opportunities excuse me, to support the program through volunteering. As of March 21st, 2014, 1,780 participating parents contributed 9,556 volunteer hours with an in-kind equivalent of $17,239. The volunteering opportunities include helping in the classrooms, attending field trips and governance committees such as the policy committee, the policy council, and various subcommittees. Um, I'm fortunate to have served as the chair of the policy committee where we've worked with key management staff to um, plan, review budgets and assessments, and also receive training. And in the interest of continuous improvement, last year's policy committee made recommendations to potentially increase the participation of future FESEP Head Start and Early Head Start families. Um, this school year, the staff, in collaboration with the families, addressed the recommendation by es establishing social media and technology subcommittee. This allowed the subcommittee members the opportunity to attend virtual training, um, planning meetings using uh, a tool called Blackboard Collaborate. That virtual option and the training to use it um, was made available to all parents who, who would like, oops, excuse me, who wanted to use that as, as another tool to participate when they couldn't actually physically be in a meeting. Parents in the subcommittee also 
posted program events and updates to the Policy Committee's Facebook page and explored other media outlets for promoting the benefits of the FESEP Head Start program as well as upcoming opportunities and events. Another recommendation was to incorporate booths with information about the work of the Policy Committee as well as the various subcommittees into the initial countywide Head Start parent meeting. Last year's policy meeting or policy committee executive board designed a presentation board to energize parents about the benefits of taking a leadership role in the FESEP Head Start program. In addition, each early childhood specialist assigned to support subcommittees created similar boards to garner attention and, and excitement from the new parents about the possibilities for meaningful participation at the committee level. This year was a success and we definitely plan on continuing that practice. The final recommendation of last year's policy committee was to create, to create a video that energizes parents to participate at all levels of governance that includes messages from parents spoken in their home language in order to reduce the language barrier to involvement. Members of the policy committee executive board have begun videotaping messages to incoming parents to be used in a video presentation encouraging parents to get involved as early as possible. We will continue this as well as a means of further reaching out to the parents beyond just two-dimensional pictures and flyers. Uh, this year, the FESEP Head Start Parent Policy Advisory Committee has three recommendations to engage the families in their child's education. The first is revising the family orientation PowerPoint presentation to include the video message from current policy committee members and encourage the parents at all levels of governance for the coming school year. The second is to increase the number of training opportunities for parents using various forms of technology, particularly in the area of building parent leadership capacity. And the third is to create a parent training model to orient parents to the use of technology, those who may not have um, as much access as others, and expand the offering of completing basic forms classes in, in targeted areas. As for my personal experience with the program and the policy committee, I have to first comment on the staff. Um, formalities of Robert's rules aside and governance, I've learned a lot from the staff that I've interacted with, not just in terms of governance, but just as early childhood educators. Um, as a parent, of course, I assume I know what's best for my child, but I have been guilty of autopilot parenting and just going through the motions of we wake up, breakfast, go to school, work, come back, dinner, bath, bed. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, sometimes it happens. Um, but it seems that at every one of our meetings, I've been offered the opportunity to learn something new about how to engage him, um, how to further his development socially, or just communicate certain lessons to him that are beneficial. And the tips really work. There are a lot of eye-opening <laughs> lessons I've had um, this year. Uh, Maura Burke actually gave a presentation recently on executive function and how to address it throughout your child's development. Telling my son to slow down and think, 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 she literally sung a song, um, is forever burned into my memory and I mean it's something I will, I will take with me. Um, it's, um, mainly because it's huge in terms of having a little boy. They like to move fast. He literally says, I'm fast all the time. So having him slow down for a second to make a decision um, is, is, is helpful. Um, I'd also like to share a little bit about my family. Um, it's small. There are two of us, my son, Kieran, and I. Um, Kieran was actually born during the junior year of my junior year of college. Um, and as the first person in my family to attend college, I was very determined to finish. I didn't take any time off from school, and I graduated the semester after he was born with a BA in communication. And like many others, I was expecting my hard work to pay off in terms of gainful employment, and like many others, I was very disappointed. Unfortunately, being a college graduate was no longer making something of yourself. It had become a pre-qualifier in job requisitions. And as a parent, I had to become stable. And for me, that meant having a salary. So, excuse me, um, my, I continued my search. It took a very long time and even included me temporarily accepting defeat and returning to school. And after a year of classes, I decided to try again. And I mean, it was, it was because my fears of my son not getting a good head start to his education grew with every day, every month, he got closer and closer to four and five years old. And 
it, it, <laughs> it got a little real. So as recently as April of last year, I was actually unemployed, excuse me. Um, I had no knowledge of the Head Start program before actually receiving advice from someone, and I'm very glad that I took that advice and applied. Not only did it afford me the opportunity to work during regular business hours without the stress of quality care for my son, but it also provided a quality preschool education. He currently attends an elementary school in one of the top school districts in the country. Kieran literally comes home every day trying to teach me a new song or asking me to count with him or wanting to play I Spy with letters and words as we drive home. At his second assessment this year, um, his teacher told me, it was just halfway through the year, his teacher told me that she felt that at that moment he was already ready for kindergarten and that daily she pulls him aside with other students to work with him privately because he's a little more advanced in terms of I guess you would call it math, numbers, <laughs> and letters, and writing, um, and that literally brought me to tears. A lot of people, a lot of people look down on programs like this, and maybe it's for political reasons, or it's because it's seen as a handout, or that people involved are considered a liability to those who work hard. I am living proof that those overgeneralized generalized assumptions are just that, they are overgeneralized. I have a post-secondary education. I have a very promising and somewhat lucrative career in business development and an amazing son whose future looks just as amazing as he is. And, <laughs> excuse me, this program has helped us through what once looked like defeat. And it's kept us from becoming a statistic and from becoming that social liability. Thank you. Ms. Mass, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it is, you know, the great strength of Head Start FESAP, I think, um, that it provides so much for the parents, but it's a two-way street. The parents provide a whole lot for the program as well. I just want to say, you are an excellent spokesperson for what, whatever it is, yes. For whatever it is you end up very successfully doing. And I hope you'll stay involved with the school system in, in some way. Continue. I have questions. I never good. want to. <laughs> good, good. I'm so and, glad. And I hope Mara Burke is going to sing for us. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Mara. <laughs> you did get set up there. Okay, so um, our last report, um, yes, is Title I District Advisory Council Annual Report. Hi, I'm Deanna Doan, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. That's a little bit of a tough act to follow, so <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so this was my first opportunity to serve on the District Advisory Council, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed This is really kind of my first opportunity to engage with the you know, school system as a whole, um, other than having children in them at the school level. So it was great to get to learn more about the resources and all of the programs that are available and um, to work with your, again, not to pile on the very professional staff that you, you have as resources. Karen was fantastic and Beatrice um, at just finding ways to engage us as a committee um, and make it easy on us. So as illustrated by the fact that I'm walking in late, coming in from work, and you know, um, they were just wonderful about you know, doing things virtually and making this very accessible, which is fantastic. Um, so just by way of background, um, as you may know, uh, Title I mandates that um, all of the, to be able to get the grants from the program, that family engagement is a piece of that. So alongside language arts and mathematics and professional development, that you actually are intentional about reaching out for family engagement. Um, and the District Advisory Council is one way that, that we do that in the county. Um, so it's an all-volunteer organization with parent representatives from the 40 Title I schools across the county this year. Um, and we, We've met, we usually meet four, I guess five times a year typically, but as you may be aware, this was a little bit of a rough winter, so we met four times. We had one canceled, but we did some virtually and used surveys and other tools to help keep us engaged. 
Um, so to give you a little bit of context for, for my background, I'm the parent of three sons, so I feel your pain. <laughs> and I, there's a lot of chaos in my life. I have a um, sixth grader this year, a second grader, and a kindergartner. And because we've moved within the county and we had children in the Spanish immersion program, I've actually touched three elementary schools in Fairfax County over the past six years, seven years, um, two of which were Title I, uh, London Town down in, in Centerville, which is a fantastic school, and then now we're at Herndon Elementary. So um, I'm a huge believer in the program. I've had the opportunity to see both, and I've had uh, um, my middle child is one that needed some extra help, and he actually has been to all three of those schools now. Um, and I can see the difference. I see that he can get the resources he needs, and that there's just more the class size and the way things are structured. It just it really helps kids that need it. So um, I'm a huge believer in the program. Um, so I'm also, by way of context, I work full time and I am the chairperson of the Spanish Immersion Committee now at Herndon. So I'm also heavily invested in the idea of um, being welcoming to people who are not professional PTA people. <laughs> Um, you know, because we tend to have schools sometimes that are very geared around a core of, of highly invested people. Um, so this year's theme was was near and dear to my heart. This year's theme was about well, creating a welcoming atmosphere at schools. Um, and I appreciated the chance to kind of stand back and think about that, both from my perspective as someone who has struggled sometimes to figure out how to fit in, and from the perspective of this diverse population in Herndon that we're working with, um, both for the immersion program and just in general to engage um, those families. So over the, four, over the course of our sessions together, we focused on just elements of a welcoming atmosphere, um, how to create a welcoming atmosphere in the parent organizations, specifically how to engage fathers and other male role models, and um, how to welcome and engage immigrant families as well. And after our series of meetings, we came out with three high-level recommendations, and I'll give you some examples of the kinds of things we were talking about. Um, so the first recommendation is to develop welcoming atmosphere resources just based upon photographs. We collected photographs along the way and best practices that we collected and that can be shared as resources within schools with Title I funding. Um, and this is pretty intuitive, and it actually reflects what I found to be one of the most valuable aspects of the committee, and that was just simply hearing what's going on elsewhere, just getting those ideas and getting them happening across the different schools. Um, so some of those simple ideas are just things like, you know, having a family phone directory so that when you want to reach out to someone, you know how. And, um, using a variety of methods for communication, recognizing that newsletters are gonna work for some, a website's gonna work for another one, social media, so making sure that you're getting a good cross-section of those kinds of communication channels, making sure your meeting times vary, that we're not always scheduling things during the day, we've got stuff in the evenings. Um, someone mentioned earlier parent liaison, too. We felt it was great to talk about how that role is used in the different schools and um, really reinforce how key that can be to help everybody understand you know what parents need and what different groups of parents need and how we can how we can um, do a better job of building those relationships huge asset um, and then again seeking parent feedback in a variety of ways and I think Karen did a great job of kind of modeling some of this putting out surveys and things and helping us use and see some of the resources that are available in the county um, so the next recommendation that we, that we talked about was to promote family education programs for underserved populations within schools receiving Title I funding to foster relationships and build parent efficacy as parents in their children's um, education. So we spent a lot of time talking about how to, um, how to be inclusive of those underserved populations. And as I said, I felt I really appreciated those conversations, and um, I really found it encouraging to hear how much we're already doing across the county and to get those ideas out to where we can share them. Um, and again, the intent here is to get beyond just you know welcoming and kind of being friendly, but to, to really raise that bar so that we can um, help build our parents' capacity to be true partners in their child's education and to feel confident in that. So some of the things that we talked about there were um, things like, offering opportunities to volunteer and have leadership roles that 
accommodate a variety of interests. So again, having you know building projects or things that traditionally man, men might be more engaged in. You know, um, the bake sale might not be the right place to try to get your dads involved. There's you know, but a construction project on a playground might do that quite well. Things like that. Um, this one I thought was really key too: Ho hosting meetings and having events in the community instead of always requiring that everybody comes to us. And I know, again, in Herndon, we're sensitive to that, that you know, you have an event at the school and there are people taking buses and multiple you know, exchanges and walking for blocks to get to that school. So if we can have meetings in an apartment community across town, that helps. It helps just get people engaged. Um, Providing refreshments and childcare, you know, if we, everybody knows this is, is, you know, if you offer pizza, people will be there. And we got to make sure we have something going on for the kids if we expect parents to be able to engage. Um, translations and interpretation, I know we do a good job at this across the county. Some of the ideas that I liked that came up were actually where we could level the playing field on that, where we could say, you know what, let's hold our meeting in Spanish and have our English speakers listen in and be on the receiving end of that with translation. Um, let's have a Spanish movie night with English subtitles and things like that that help to get everybody experiencing what it's like to, to you know, have, be on the receiving end of some of those things. Um, so the final recommendation was to collaborate with the central office team, such as family and school partnerships and community-based organizations, such as the Fairfax County Council of PTAs, to foster parent leadership and advocacy skills within schools receiving Title I funding. Um, so again, I was struck over and over again just by the depth of resources that we have available to us. Um, and again, being in Herndon, I feel very strongly about the idea of schools and communities reinforcing and growing together and supporting one another and the idea that we can transform our communities by what we do through our schools. Um, just as schools are important for kind of building life skills into students, we need to think about that role in building those abilities in our parents um, for them to be able to be engaged and, and have an active dialogue. So some examples that we had for that. they. Um, we've offered uh, welcoming atmosphere workshops for front office staff meetings. Again, so back, kind of back to the welcoming atmosphere aspect here. Um, recognizing that our front office staff are often that first experience that you have with a school. So it's critical that they see themselves as being in a customer service role and that they um, receive the you know, coaching and the resources that they need. I mean, they're all busy and I know, you know they're, they, they need to protect the time of the principals and their leadership, but it's critical that as they do that, they do that in a way that is customer friendly. Um, so during those workshops, staff members were, were able to share best practices practices, strategies, identify these resources that are available. Um, another example is the Essentials of Family and Community Engagement Academy course that's offered to staff members, to, to um, administrators, counselors, teachers, parent liaisons, basically giving them, again, opportunities to hear ways that they can be welcoming in their environment and kind of coach them along the way. Um, the other thing we talked about was the seven parent information phone lines with different languages and that, that re those resources are available for, for parents to reach out and be able to communicate in their native language. Um, that information was shared you know, with, uh, with, the with us as DAC representatives and also with staff members and families in the county. Um, and then the welcoming atmosphere walkthrough that can be conducted, so we, where you invite, a school can invite um, the opportunity to have people come and say, well, do I feel welcomed here, and gives feedback. Um, so I, 13 of the 40 Title I schools have already done that, so that would be, again, making others aware that that's a resource that they could use. Um, and I'm encourage again, the opportunity to engage on the committee has given me the opportunity to continue that conversation. I think we're already doing that. I know we've met and, um, you know, we're talking about ways, well, you know, what if we, if I'm trying to build um, relationships between my English and Spanish speakers, can ACE come teach a Spanish class at my school that I can market that with my parents and try to get that and then reinforce it with conversation groups so that we're getting, so things like that. Um, it's been a great opportunity for me to get to know what's out there and know who to reach out to, You're like one person now. Um, <laughs> So it's been a great experience for me in summary, and I really, um, I know I'll be back next year. I enjoyed the opportunity to do this. I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the full report and just see some of what else is out there. Um, 
and that's all I have for them. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ms. Stone. Excellent. I'm, I'm reminded again of the enormity of what you all do, you know, not only in terms of the volume, the depth, and breadth of your work, but also the importance of it. So before we start with our questions, I just thought maybe if we could all just recognize, I know the folks in the room here are a fraction of all the people who have worked on these committees, but if we could just recognize the staff and um, volunteers here um, before we start our questions. Okay, so, um, we, uh, and again, board members, we're going to go ahead and um, give everyone a, a first um, shot, and then, you know, we'll have go backs, so assuming we have time. You all, by the way, did a very good job of keeping uh, it, it to your time uh, <laughs> request, so that's wonderful. Um, and uh, so I'll be taking, okay, M Ms. Evans, go ahead and start, and, and we'll go ahead and ask questions of, of every, uh, everyone you have questions for at once, okay? Thank you, Ms. Evans. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, those were absolutely excellent reports and I just want to thank you all for all your work and for the um, the thoroughness with which you uh, attacked the your charges this year it is very very impressive and I guess I wanted to um, just start with with the young lady um, uh, talking about Head Start and I, I just want to thank you for sharing your story and your son's story you know I think that that uh, tells us so much about the how this program affects a real um, mom and a real child, and, and that was, um, it's very important for us to see that. I really only had one question, and you mentioned that you had not signed up because you know, until somebody told you about it. And um, that made me wonder about something, and I, I don't know if you have the answer to this, or perhaps if Ms. Burke does, that. Um, you said the waiting list is has increased this year, um, and I'm wondering is that is that because of more need or because more people are signing up or some combination of the two or do we know, do we have a sense of that? Um, as you know, um, historically we always have a large wait list, even right. though we continue to increase That's, the number of classrooms. Right, we, we have. really increased it a lot this year. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, we don't have data that says one is a result of the other, so I can't really speak to that. I, I do know that we increasingly see a need. We have families that don't always hear about it in a right. timely manner for whatever reason, and we are continually looking for feedback about how we can reach out to the community and um, get the word out to How families. did you find out? I guess that might be helpful for us to to hear if there was it was an official It was, it was from um, a, a family member. Oh. Um, my grandfather okay. actually is has lived in this area for a very long time. Um, and he a, a long time ago had his has his children in Head Start. And that's just so you just heard yeah, kind of he word was, of mouth. It was wasn't actual, an official. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was he was the, the point person, and it has been for such a long time since I've moved to this area. Just at how much Fairfax County offers to people um, and to families in, in any type of need in terms of education or, or anything really. Right. Um, and it's I yeah through him and then the internet. <laughs> well, well, congratulations. It sounds like you, you've done really, really, really well with that, and I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, my questions for the, the um, I guess I have once both with the Title I and with HRAC. Um, both of you mentioned parent liaisons, and this is a subject near and dear to my heart. You know, I just feel very, very strongly about the parent liaison. Piece. We still, and I, I think it's time that we finally put parent liaisons on as as full-time employees or half-time employees, and uh, I think we should pursue that. Is that something that you all would support? Let me, I believe last year you recommended that from HRAC. Uh, yes, honestly, that's like music to our ears, um, to my ears. At South Lakes, I am responsible for, we have, uh, two liaisons. We have a Spanish liaison and we also have an Arabic liaison. And um, the, the amount of work that they do, not only day to day with the students, but also to support the community in, in every facet from A to Z. It's just amazing um, the work that they do. And I know that from our report on last year, that certainly was a suggestion and a recommendation. Um, I've spoken personally, I've spoken to our liaisons and it's very 
difficult for them uh, in order to uh, maintain the number of hours to make uh, employment actually worthwhile, they usually are at more than one school. And that makes it tremendously difficult to try to um, learn the communities and really be an important part of the community when they're moving around so much. Did you have a comment as well? I can. I can only speak from personal experience. I don't have the broad view, but um, but I can say from at Herndon, it's been critical to have that um, liaison be the person. We have a coalition of the willing as we're trying to stand up this Spanish immersion committee. Um, as you may know, Herndon is phasing that in starting in kindergarten this year. So it's a small group and we have a group of parents that are very excited and energized and have huge goals and are stumbling all over ourselves trying to figure out like when do we get the flyers in? How do we get them translated? You know, just trying to navigate the school system. Um, and the parent liaison, Addie Gonzalez there has been our saving grace and helping us figure out how to do that. So again, just a, you know, one data point, but from my experience, it's, it's been huge. And I believe that um, Herndon is able, and I don't know if anyone knows this, is able to have Addie as a full-time resource because we're Title I. Is that, I think that's how we're using some of our Title I funding. Um, and I see the benefit, again, of that. Right. And I would just say to, to, um, to all of you and, and to my colleagues as well, I think that it's time that we, um, we made this change because these are absolutely critical positions. Um, and I, I take to heart, too, what you say about communication and the difficulty with navigating on, on the web. I know that there are people who, for whom it, uh, the phone, you know, just the plain old phone is, is the way that they communicate or a text message. And I do think that we need to be working on that. One, of, um, one area that I think we might help is if we have an ombudsman. So that's uh, where somebody could just go and say, I don't know where to go. You know, you're the person. So I, I, I appreciate you pinpointing the communication piece because, and I think all of you have mentioned that we have these great resources and it's a question of making sure people know about them. So, so thank you for that. And with um, Shaq, I just had a couple of comments and questions. A marvelous job with putting together a very complicated and thorough wellness policy. So, so kudos to you for doing that. Um, you know, again, you, you, you talked about communication, and we're, you know, we kind of all talked about communication as an important piece on this. Um, but with the, um, the, the tobacco-free policy, that's, this is what, maybe your fifth year or something recommending tobacco-free? It's, I think this has been an ongoing uh, uh, issue. Yeah, maybe. I know it was definitely in last year's report and, and before that, but for how many years, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to mention that the Park Authority has recently had its own signage made up to have a voluntary tobacco-free um, you know, ban in, of smoking in its parks. And to get around any legal concerns, it's been a, a voluntary one. And I would like to pursue that idea for us to possibly combine with the Park Authority in Fairfax County. I think it, um, that's something that we can pursue on that. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that recommendation to us as well. Um, I uh, wanted to thank you for, for uh, mentioning the importance of sleep as part of the school environment. And again, for I think the eighth or ninth year supporting later start times. Um, I um, also appreciate you wanting to have the mental health piece. That's a topic that of course is um, something that's, that's been raised increasingly this year. So um, certainly I support you on that and you know we can work together on, on a charge. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Mr. Moon? Oh, thank you, Ms. Hines. Uh, I have a couple of questions to a couple of you know, presenters. Uh, be before I do that, I want to thank all the presenters for presentations. Uh, I am so moved by a, a not only your presentations, but the time and efforts that go into a working on these committees uh, for your kids, my kids, 187,000 students in Fairfax County. So thank you yeah, for your service. Uh, I do have a one quick question first before I go into the other two. One to a Shaq about that most comprehensive tobacco-free policy. Uh, I think you mentioned that there are school districts in Virginia 
which do have a such policy. Would you be able to tell us which is critics we should look into? Yeah, I think the, the issue that we've heard is that there, there, the committee's not sure what is the, the most comprehensive that's allowable okay. by law. So even though some other districts throughout the Commonwealth have um, absolutely finite uh, and, and, and comprehensive policies that um, you know, prohibit tobacco use by anyone, anytime. I mean, you know, athletic games, weekends, rentals of facilities. The committee can't offer an opinion if, if whether those other districts around the Commonwealth are complying with I understand other that. requirements of the Code of Virginia or not, mm -hmm. or pursuing other options. So, so we've supported a, a comprehensive policy, but we thought we'd qualify it by saying whatever you know, the board and your, and your, your legal uh, advisors uh, say is the most uh, comprehensive allowable by law, that's what would, we would support. Yeah, we have wrestled with that issue you know, a few times in the past, and well, I'm sure that we'll revisit the issue in the near time. Thank you, and I have a question to uh, both uh, Title I and FISAP Head Start. Uh, I wish that we had unlimited amount of funds to eliminate uh, waiting list on any program, you know, not just the FACEP Head Start or Pre-K or, or any program. Uh, but since that's not the case, that's not the case, with the given amount of funding we have, is there any policy regulation or practice we are currently doing you believe, in your opinion, could be improved, enhanced, changed? I, I, I'm not quite clear what you're asking me. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, without <laughs> asking us to put in more funding so, to your programs, uh -huh. looking at our current policies and regulations and practices in delivering service okay. for your respective programs. Okay. Is there anything we should do differently? Okay, now, now I understand, yeah. I, I, um, so I think there's a couple things that I, okay. I, I, I would think about. Um, I think currently um, the FISAP Head Start teachers are not included in the, um, the uh, um, ratios in terms of the staffing ratios. So uh, those, our teachers don't have um, planning time. We have to supplement their planning time and offer a um, substitute to go in weekly. So they meet the qualifications of the, the requirements at the state level for teachers to have planning time. So I, that would be a, a big policy I would <laughs> like to be changed so that not only are we, um, then I think we could use those funds to increase the number of classrooms that we then uh, could have, because it, it, is, it is a large portion of our budget to support teachers having planning time. Um, so that would be, that would be a, a major one for me, and I think our team. You want the same team, <laughs> correct? Exactly. She speaks for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to defer to Beatrice Huffman in the back. Over here. <laughs> Is there anything that you wanted to add, Beatrice? Beatrice is our coordinator for Title I. Here. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll stand. I'll stand. Um, uh, so I believe your question is regards particularly to early childhood education and, and supports there. Uh, so currently this year, um, with support of the the leadership team and ac an academic learning group within Fairfax leadership, we have been really looking closely at the way that. Um, Title One funding is distributed both at the central level as well as the school level. So we're looking how we can really effectively, effectively utilize that central level funding to make sure we're maximizing what we can 
um, contribute to early childhood education, both in the terms of additional fees up classrooms, which we're, um, we're actually looking at doing for this uh, coming year, pending facilities. And <laughs> we are also um, looking at ways that we can expand, as I know the board as well has, um, has see, seen fit to do, um, the early literacy programs for particularly African heritage families, which was a need identified through the Minority Student Achievement um, Oversight Committee, and um, additional hippie classes for native English speaking minority families in our high poverty communities. So those are some of the ways that we're currently looking within Title I, and um, again, with guidance, we would love guidance from the board as well as from the leadership team as far as how we can make um, those decisions that will really um, both allow for strong decision making at the school leadership level for meeting individualized needs for the schools, which we know do differ significantly from geographic area to geographic area in our division, but also to meet those division-wide needs that we have, such as early childhood education. Okay, thank you. I, can, can I add? I think the other piece that we always have to remember, although we truly appreciate the funding to increase the number of classrooms, in order to maintain the quality program, which I think we have, there also has to be ratios maintained around the support that um, Shana eloquently spoke about that she received. So when we add more children, we also have to think about adding uh, additional staff that will work with families that um, can uh, provide mental health um, support, all these other pieces. So it's, it's although the wait list weighs heavy on us and is truly important and we'd like it to be addressed, it's just not a matter of finding classrooms for kids that um, in order to uh, get the outcomes that we are currently um, achieving with children and families, that we really look at the additional comprehensive services that we also um, uh, use um, to, in order to support our families and kids. And, sorry, just really quickly. From a parent perspective, um, I'm remembering an, an instance at a meeting of ours where we had a large portion taken up by a parent or a couple of parents who were very concerned about their teacher having just time in general. Um, and I remember Maura actually addressing the planning period for the teachers. And these parents were expressing that they don't think that their teacher actually even got that planning period. Or if so, it was very, very short because they had the substitute come in temporarily to, to free up that time for the teacher. Um, and this isn't necessarily an issue of funding, although it does sound pretty reasonable in terms of, of actually providing that for the teachers so that the Head Start program is not spending money on on putting, or excuse me, providing substitutes. I feel like maybe in terms of health, it's necessary um, for the teachers to have that time. One of the things that I kept hearing about before I moved to this area and I see every day, even in the fact that my son doesn't get, he doesn't, he doesn't get naps. And I'm like, wow, like you guys, you know, they really, they really make sure they get a full day's worth of education. Um, the quality has to be upheld somehow, and I, that has to—I mean, that obviously starts with the teachers, and that they are adequately taken care of um, in terms of, of their health, and that directly affects their job performance. So, I mean, not only would it benefit the program financially, but I think it would also just benefit the teachers and the quality of the education that they're providing. Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I can certainly agree with you uh, on, and th on that point. Even the school board members need to take care of their health, and they suffer from lack of sleep uh, or too many emails. Uh, I have a, one more question to a uh, presenter from uh, Title I. I think you are the one who mentioned about engaging immigrant families. Uh, as an immigrant myself who came to the U.S. as a teenager, uh, he, he going through schools in a completely new environment was not an easy task. And I, I bet that you know, same will apply to uh, immigrant parents you know, who are navigating through a foreign school system, uh, very, very different from where they're coming from, uh, you know, fighting not only the different schools, you know, learning to uh, 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 the, the challenge of learning a new school system, but also probably you know, needing to find a stable job to support the family financially, and also having to learn the language, the language itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had a tremendous benefit by having a mentor mm -hmm. 
when I was going to school, who just guide me through mm -hmm. my daily life, daily routine. Mm -hmm. um, it, would be, it would be really nice for, I think, even families, mm -hmm. you know, grown-ups, to have a mentors within schools. It's not, in that kind of mentor-mentee relationship, I don't think it is just a mentee who benefits, but mentor will also benefit. That was not my case when I had that relationship. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, and we did talk about that in our um, committee sessions, and we've talked about it in the context of Herndon as we're standing up this immersion committee, too. One of the things that I'm wrestling with, and I'm open to thoughts and ideas, if everyone has anything. Um, so we've talked about it in terms of uh, kind of, the words that keep coming up are like adopt a family and stuff, but it sounds so one-sided. And to your exact point, I want we want this to be a two-way thing, right? Where we we who are have some context for this culture can offer what how you know so the, that kind of how's how you navigate. Here's some some tips, but likewise we can gain a ton by being able to hear, you know, get that more diverse perspective and understand more of um, those barriers that our community is facing as a whole. Um, so if anybody has any good words around that, you know, what, what do we call, is it a, family partnership is used so broadly, it's, it's, it's almost too broad. So anyway, we're, we're wrestling with that exact that exact concept. Yeah, yeah, I think absolutely. that you know, that sort of relationship should be promoted. I think yeah. not only just for Title I schools or Head Start programs, absolutely. but throughout the entire school system. Yep. There are a couple of um, programs that come to mind. Uh, several of our schools have established parent ambassadors, uh, parent leaders within their schools from different cultural backgrounds, often whom who have been new immigrants to the United States who become leaders in their community within the school and are there just should parents have questions during different events and want to speak to somebody in their language, aware of their culture, um, and, and just kind of access points for these families. Um, Brookfield Elementary is one, Daniel's Run is another. Um, there are also, and, and Betra spoke to the early literacy program earlier, the Hispanic early literacy program has a parent leadership component that they've expanded upon their, their current eight week session course. Uh, where parents who go through the course then become leaders within the school and connect with other families. So th these, these efforts are important and they are recognized by our schools and there, there's movement in, to establish those relationships. Uh, is there anything school board can do to assist further promoting that movement? I think what you're doing in terms of continuing to support the early literacy program um, with the ongoing contribution of, uh, that you, you so generously gave last week, I think that's going to really help th those programs grow and develop um, and continuing to support the parent liaisons as we, sp as we spoke to earlier because they really get a lot of those parent volunteer and parent leadership programs going. Um, those, that's another way that the board could certainly support these efforts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, uh, Dr. Garza was, was chomping at the bit here to say a few things. <laughs> so if you want to go ahead and. I'll, I'll wait till the end, I guess. Okay, she's going to wait till the I end. <laughs> jumping in on, on early. Okay, all right. Um, and I know that Ms. Mask, you, you have a little one at home and you uh, uh, I have, will be, you have to leave at a certain time, right? Or You're okay? Okay, all right, thank you. I don't want to keep you in it. Um, thank you. Ms. Strauss? Also, thank you for all of your wonderful reports and for the, the service that you provide, first to your children and to your families and to your school and then all to the rest of us. We are very, very grateful for the time that you dedicate because we all learn and uh, we are here to serve every single one of the children who come to us and try to get better every day. So thank you very much. Um, first for Shaq, um, with the CDC wellness policy and... Um, Obviously, we've had a wellness policy, and we spent we spent a lot of time in the last couple of years talking about the uh, sort of the overall um, uh, mental health needs of children, nutrition needs, sleep needs, etc. Is our current wellness policy? I mean, what what shape are we in from your perspective on our current policy? Um, the current policy I have here, um, just <clears throat> off the top of your head, are we most okay? Are we in that? in fulfilling the requirements for um, accountability to the community, reporting to the community, um, assessing the policy down to the individual school level is what the, the new federal legislation um, 
uh, asks for. What kind of what kind of data are they asking for? Uh, that has not been published okay. in specific, but it, they do require um, that down to the individual school level that schools um, report on their um, compliance um, with the local district's policy. Okay, so I guess that would be an interesting follow-up if there is something that we need to do differently than what we're doing now. Oh, we can't, we, uh, with the Golden Wellness, uh, the... Right, we do the Golden right, Wellness, I know, because so we, we do a lot of it. The question is, because I know as this evolves from the, from the federal, I mean, is there more that we need to be paying attention to right now, are we? Yeah, no, most of it is the, the public involvement, the assessment, the monitoring. Um, and then there's just a little bit more specifics. Um, we have currently in ours um, guidelines for nutrition and physical right. education mostly. Right, right. But okay. the, um, the federal um, requirements, you know, mention, um, they, they mention a broad category uh, that the wellness policy should include being other, you know, areas that affect school and student and health wellness. So, you know, we have a couple of the specifics, but the federal legislation is asking for more. So what is that more that we would include? Well, that's what I it would probably be mental health. It would be health nutrition. It would be okay. the things that the CDC right. recommends that are included to make the policy more comprehensive. Okay. And were you going to... Uh, and I'll just remind that last year when we came before to propose that we work on this wellness policy, we had been charged with looking at the community transformation grant right. and to see how uh, the school system could align with the vision right. of that as well. Right. And it was, it, it is, I think the words that I used last year were, it was a no-brainer. Uh, the language in that uh, grant seemed to practically be guiding us in this direction and so we wanted to take what the vision of that grant was and see if we could take that CDC uh, model and use that as our framework for building this. So we are building on what the requirement is, okay. the federal requirement is, that will will be the core of it, but we obviously want to look at this holistic picture for our for our school system, not not just not just what they're eating and not just going to gym, uh, basically. We want to look at everything that's going to affect them um, and bring, I think, um, it was been uh, health in all things. Right, health um, in all things, right. Health in right. all things. Right. That, that was, was, uh, that was that how we ended the wellness. Yes. Right. The, Community wellness the, thing. the exact language from the USDA in, in their um, um, policy advisory bulletin is that um, local... Uh, let's see, LEAs must establish wellness policy leadership of one or more uh, school officials who have the authority and responsibility to ensure each school complies with the policy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Dr. Garz is shaking her hands. We must be okay. All right. <laughs> um, I've been to several meetings where they've talked about the medical home to school issue, and I have to admit, I still don't quite understand what that is, but it's all right. Um, Moving on to um, uh, Title I and uh, Head Start. And again, it's, always, it's so impressive to hear from you guys. It's just, we are so proud of what you do and your stories and what you do. First, I have to start with our Herndon um, two-way immersion Spanish program that is so exciting that it's, that it's starting. And we all have a few <coughs> welts on the back, yes. but we, we did it. <laughs> We're going to get over that. Yeah. Get yes, over and so it's, it's very exciting to, to hear that you now have two hats with that. Mm -hmm. And I do remember when we were discussing um, at the beginning of this program, one of the parents said one of the reasons why she wanted, she herself wanted her child to be, you know, one of the first members of the new two-way Spanish program, and she said, because I will learn Spanish too. Mm -hmm. And I will be a part of a more inclusive total school community. Yeah. Yeah. She said, all these wonderful children, and I don't understand them, and I need to, and I don't understand their parents, and I need to. So it was the, the two-way desire to yeah. be able to, um, to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And and I loved your idea of having a movie in Spanish with English subtitles, mm -hmm. so that there truly is an understanding and a respectful yep. relationship between all of our children and families. So, yep. go for it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that with the Title One, um, with many with your meetings, you offer the opportunity for electronic 
um, meeting attendance, which mm -hmm. is so impressive. Mm -hmm. Do we do that with Head Start at all? Yes. Yes. That was the. Um, that's what I thought you said. Um, I touched on it briefly, but um, right. that was something that we implemented this year with okay. offering the Blackboard Collaborate tool, mm -hmm. and that actually is a presentation tool. Um, and parents, any parent that wanted to receive training in it was offered that opportunity so that they could participate in, in the meetings virtually. And from it, how many, from, for your Head Start meetings, how many parents are actually taking you up on that? Some? Sure. more the executive board took you. I don't, do you guys know that from uh, Do we know? But some? I, I believe some took advantage of it more with the executive board than the larger okay. committee right. piece. Um, yeah. They did get, they, they um, took part in it. But I think, again, it, it was limited um, in terms of who took advantage of it. Several, many parents participated in the training, but then the and actual. They didn't uh, At least they, they trained because, yes, I mean, these the are, training. these are important tools that have, have mm -hmm. obviously significance in your, mm -hmm. in your, your, your job and, mm -hmm. and when your kids moving up through the grades are going to need yeah, all of that. Definitely. So that's just a wonderful reason. And the other, and I know in um, HRIC you're talking about communication. I am curious from all of you, because I know from um, many of my families in Herndon, we have found that some of the young moms, we don't, may, we not, may not have a landline phone, may not have a reliable permanent address, but they have an iPhone. What is, is am, am I correct in this, and this is an important way to reach many of our young families who may have other resource challenges, but they have their iPhone. That's what we're hearing from, again, in, in Hernan as we're standing at this mm -hmm. committee. That was one of our questions was what is the best way to reach this population and making sure that it does end up in their pocket and their phone. So we'll have you know, our flyers and everything that's going out, but we always make sure we have a translated keep in touch that goes out exactly. to those, to that population so that they'll get it in a way that, and we actually, so our first meeting where we had kind of a parent engagement thing, we did a bedtime stories for the kids. Um, and so you're talking three classes. We targeted just three classes of kindergartners. Um, and we had probably 25 parents and families there which was I thought out of you know 75 seven, less cool. than 75 kids so and a pouring down night which again makes a difference when you're taking a bus and then walking many blocks you know so sure. um, yeah so so far so good I mean we want to keep working on it but right. but we are trying very hard to make okay. sure that we get it in a way that they'll respond to it. and what about iPhones for our Head Start committees and families I'm sorry uh, the iPhone Yes, we, Texting, we, yeah, Twitter, we do, what have we, you. We have seen an increase in okay. um, the handhelds for our families, even if they don't have other resources, exactly. as you suggested. Because all the teenagers have Yes. Them, so. <laughs> the teenagers do grow and become parents. And I assume. think that's one of the reasons why we also do some work on Facebook. We also have um, things, if you go to our website, you can see that we have news and resources for families right there that then have links that allow them to access some information beyond just our, in the community, in the greater community community just not through our program great thank you yeah and linked if you have a Facebook account you have an email and although that's becoming something that seems to be a little dated um, we do we send folks. out a lot in email um, another thing that we've implemented this year is a very colorful live newsletter that goes out um, regularly so not only does the newsletter actually have information that's valuable to parents but there's there are links provided there are flashing lights at really important things and um, it, it's just a great way to communicate with parents. Usually half of me scrolling down my iPhone to get to the newsletter is the list of emails that this has been sent to. So um, I, do, I do feel that it's, it's reaching a lot of parents. Um, and even more outdated, um, but one thing that I think is, is critical is actually letting the parents know that those things are available. So if we don't have their information or we're not in touch with them, letting them know that that resource is actually there. And one of the ways that I've been made available, or excuse me, privy to information that I didn't know um, before was through my son's backpack. I mean, yes, every person has an iPhone, but if you know they're a part of the Head Start or Title I community, they also have a kid. So if you put something on their child, <laughs> right, the you child pin it is to gonna them. come back and they're gonna see it. Um, so, I mean, that has been very helpful, the teacher letting me know, hey, check his backpack because we give you information through that. So even if, you know, hopefully this never happens, but I lose my job and my car and my phone and my you other still phone have your and my backpack. iPad and everything, 
I'm, I'm not going to lose my kid. So <laughs> it's going to come to or me somehow. Or pinned to the back of the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. So, so I think that that's sort of an interesting tip that for many of our parents, they've become wireless, and we may have concerns about other forms of communication, but they, many of them have leaped far ahead of us. So um, they've joined a generation that's beyond. Okay, I think that's it. So again, thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Joss. I have Ms. Reed to be followed by Mr. McElmay. Okay. Thank you all very much. Um, I think this is one of our most favorite times of the year because we get to uh, get briefed on all the very good work that you've done. And, um, and when we hear a couple of these uh, presentations back to back, we start to see some threads. And I hope that you all have, have heard them too. And just from my observation, I'll start with a few comments and then get to the questions. Um, one right off the bat, the recognition of diversity and the need to have people connect with one another. And, and to recognize that people have different needs and take different paths. And uh, that was something I heard loud and clear, and I was very intrigued by the uh, ideas of further accentuating the CTE and the academy programs, um, because everybody doesn't have to have the same path, and I think that's something that we should take to heart and try to do better, because I think that um, creates a lot of stress for people, um, and of course we know that a lot of our kids and parents, uh, really probably everyone in this room is under too much stress. So. Um, we need to give, give kids options. Another theme is the importance of parent communication and participation in education. And um, I know that that's easier said than done. We talk about that every year, it seems. Um, how do we reach the parents that don't come to our meetings? And um, how do we address the cultural barriers for people who don't feel they should be part of the educational experience. So those are things that I think we're, we still grapple with. Uh, the importance of early childhood education, uh, of course, and when you look in the materials um, and in the charts, Appendix C in particular, when we saw the graphs, and if somebody hasn't looked at that, my gosh, you got to look at that. It absolutely jumps off the page, the amount of impact that FESEP Head Start has on the achievement of cohorts throughout the system. So uh, I, I think we all believe, and we just talked about it at the board table uh, during the budget deliberations, that we've got to figure out how to do more of that. And every year, Maura, you know it's coming, I ask you, right, uh, what, uh, what can we do to, uh, to get through that waiting list? Is there a different way that we can do business? I mean, we've got facilities issues. But to me, these are kids, um, if we've got, what, 900 or whatever that are waiting, they'll never get that time back. And then they're going to go to kindergarten, and they're going to be behind from day one, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, should we be... Uh, looking at things differently. Are you all doing that? Could you kind of give us a sense for, for where you're heading? And are we uh, reaching out to our partners, the churches, the other people who provide these kind of services? Should we be pooling our efforts? Um, I, I think you're correct. We always run into facility issues being um, in a, a county that the number of students grow every year, um, K to 12, we know. So um, recently, we just actually this morning, we had a, a, a good meeting with facilities to begin t uh, t our conversation, um, not to begin, to continue our conversation about identifying um, opportunities to use different types of buildings around the county. So we started that conversation to begin to look at other opportunities within the county um, to house um, some classrooms. I think with that, we also have to remember that if we go outside a school, there is infrastructure in a school that really supports the program being what it is. Things like the library, thing, somebody at the front office, um, a clinic aid that can support when a child gets hurt. So there are pieces that we can't forget. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this notion of it's important to provide services, but what the, these outcomes are really a result of the comprehensive program that we provide and the infrastructure that FCPS supply, supplies. That said, it doesn't mean it can't happen. We just need to be thoughtful about how we are going to provide those supports. And if we do go outside of school, Again, unfortunately, it means additional funding. How do we put somebody? So we're a Graham Road community building is a good example right now. 
we had to hire somebody hourly to sit at that front office because the classrooms aren't the close there and if a parent needs to access their child they need to get to the classroom somebody needs to be available to let that fam that family member in we also had an incident where a child fell on the playground there was nobody there to check the child out the teachers have uh, first aid training, but not to the extent of a clinic aid. They had to call an ambulance because there is no administrator sitting there. They called us, but we're down the road. We it took us a while to get there. So these are all important considerations as we look to um, buildings outside the public schools. In terms of our partners, we have a very good relationship with Office for Children, and they do wonderful work in the community, and we continue to collaborate and support that. They 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 actually have slots that are in uh, programs like uh, uh, faith-based uh, programs as well as community programs. So those are happening. We've also had an opportunity to speak to a church out in Clifton, a preschool that is uh, connected to a church and looking at ways we can partner with them. I think, again, it's, uh, we, there are variables that we have to consider when we go outside the school system. Um, uh, uh, and from if they are going to be public school employees, if they come from the county, I, there's other considerations. Um, but we are on that path, and we are having conversations with facilities to look at how we can better access um, some available space in the community. Thank you very much. And a follow-up question: um, are, are there specific uh, strings tied to the Title I funds? In other words, mm -hmm. could we uh, we spend it, say, in you know certain grades? Is there a reason we couldn't take some of that and push it into, um, you know, early ed programs? Or is that being done now? And could is it, that it, something it, that we should do more of, perhaps? Betris Bet um, <laughs> uh, spoke to this a little bit. It, yeah. it is currently being done. I believe um, next year we'll be at eight classrooms that uh, are Title One funded. And this, so for the last three years, um, we've done some great partnership with um, Teddy and, and Betris to ensure that we're using. Title I funds to meet our early childhood needs. Excellent. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be quick and finish up. So thought-provoking. We all can't help ourselves here. Uh, and the other, the other theme, of course, is the physical and mental uh, well-being of, of our students. And to that end, I have a question for everybody. And I wonder, um, since only one group really focused on the physical and mental health, I wondered if that were um, an explicit component of the work that you all do in your areas. You know, as you talked about communicating with parents and, and other things, is there a component where you're really working on making sure that the parents and the families are receiving health and wellness um, education? Uh, yes, from uh, from HREC's perspective, uh, absolutely. As we look at the non-academic barriers, so we're constantly looking at um, breakfasts for the students. We're looking at the work that the parent liaisons do in terms of making sure that families have what they need at home, such as rent and food and clothing and, and <coughs> excuse me, clothing and all of those types of things. So we are looking at that. We're also looking at um, the well-being of students as they transition throughout the school day. You know, students have, at the high school level, they have seven different classes, seven different teachers. It's, it's go, go, go. So looking at those particular needs as well, the needs of counselors and um, other adult fo folks working with students to try to make sure that not only are they academically being pushed, but also that their social and mental and emotional well-being is taken care of. Um, I've, in my experience, I've been introduced to a few things that I didn't know existed. Um, so one of them that was pushed very early when my son started at Fairhill was um, in terms of nutrition, there are very strict rules around the children's meals, um, such as no outside food coming in. Um, they have a very specific plan. The children are learning to, to eat family style meals and serve themselves um, and in turn learning portion sizing, um, which is very important. Um, and in terms of physical health, um, other than nutrition, I, I don't know too much about it from a, a, a coordination or operations perspective, but I, I do like the fact that in facilities that are already established schools, the children actually have access to some of those things like physical education. Um, 
not only I think is it important for them to just run because they're four years old, um, but I mean, it's, it's part of education in general. Um, so it's not just enjoyable, but I mean, it, it's also good for them. Um, as you know, it, uh, Head Start is comprehensive services. So we, we have a nutritionist, uh, two, three nutritionists on our um, staff that do um, provide opportunities like grocery store tours, help parents read labels, um, supporting them and working uh, to develop healthy meals on a limited budget. So we do a lot of work directly with families. We also do cooking classes um, that, again, help families figure out how to put together a healthy meal for their family. Um, we talk a great deal about eating as a family and having conversations and um, how that supports your child educationally. We also have um, two nurses that are on our staff that um, pay attention to things like the medical home. That is a big uh, piece of our um, initiative in um, Head Start is to ensure that all families have a medical home, which means that they have a doctor that they see, that they don't use the emergency room, that we, we work with them to get either get insurance through their employer or some sort of um, uh, um, a chip program or um, uh, a federally um, a federal health care program so that is that is a big piece of our work um, we also do we have um, we uh, the teachers very much support the idea of physical education and being out and at, we we build playgrounds that are um, age appropriate for kids that have lots of opportunities for them to move and um, in different ways. So again, that supports their physical development. We also have mental health specialists that are on our staff. That is again an expectation of Head Start that we support um, infant, toddler, and preschool mental health as well as their family's mental health. So we do a great deal of work. We do an assessment on all our children as they come in to look at um, their um, their their social, emotional, and mental health development. That is done by the teacher as well as the parent. And then we look at that data together. And if we there are red flags, we go out, we observe the children, we reach out to families to provide them the support. and. Um, uh, direct them and support them in accessing supports in the community where they can receive direct services. And then uh, our, for the last two years, social work, sorry, yes, social workers from each of the Title I schools and then this year, counselors from each of the Title I schools have had the opportunities to come together and share, because they, they have a lot of common in terms of parent population needs, um, share resources, identify mental health opportunities uh, for families to access within the community, um, and then take some of that back to their, their families. Uh, often our social workers and counselors host parent workshops in collaboration with parent liaisons on such topics throughout the year. And parent liaisons also receive training through Family School Partnerships Office as well on the same topics to then go back and take it and, and share it with families. Excellent, thank you. I do have other questions, but I think I should yield to my colleagues, and if there's time, we'll I'll come back to me. But thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Yeah, we're, we are at 8.50, just in case anyone was wondering where we are, but, and I know we all have more questions than we can possibly go through tonight. And thank you all so much. Um, I have Mr. McElvain next, to be followed by Mr. Belkoff. So thank you all for all your work um, over the past year. I love the idea of doing the, the subtitled movies. In fact, I think, as a school board, if we were to conduct our meetings in Spanish, Korean, um, Chinese, um, they'd actually be, they'd be a lot shorter, yeah. So um, we should definitely think about doing that. Um, but uh, so um, I do have um, um, a question for Shaq. And of course, um, for those of you who don't know, this was a sad day. Um, in the House Appropriations Committee, they voted 31 to 18 against, um, or to support a proposal that would gut the um, Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act of 2010. So I think that's something we might want to talk about as a board in terms of taking a legislative position on that. Um, but I was wondering in your uh, conversations around wellness and whatever, and um, like my colleagues, I, I'm definitely interested in the, the smoking piece. Um, but have you talked at all about soda in schools? Um, yeah, the, the language that we included in the, in the policy and regulations um, um, are more aggressive than the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act legislation. Um, 
there will be potentially legislation that will impact all foods made available to students during the school day, and school day is up to a half hour after school ends. Um, and those things, uh, you know, Im impacted could be um, fundraising foods, uh, snacks and treats in classrooms, um, vending machines, anything, not just the official school lunch um, that would be available to, to, to students during the school day. In our policy, we included that, um, uh, you know, our recommendation for the minimum requirements to be exceeded and for um, guidelines to be set forth for before, during, and after the school day. So that could potentially impact um, uh, sodas, our, our community um, soda machines, which are uh, turned on a half hour after the school day is over. And then there, are, there also is a, a, a proposed requirement in the federal legislation that um, would require the local wellness policies to include guidelines on um, uh, how and what foods are marketed to students. So d depending on the final rule, if they say that Coke cannot have a, you know, a machine or a sign or signage or language or advertising in your school, that certainly um, is going to affect uh, sodas as well. That was most of what we wrote, but I think Ben wanted to say something too. I think just to comment on that a little bit, it's a, it's a, much, a, a much broader picture than sodas in our schools. We see a lot of sugary products, fatty products, and the psychology around that with the students associating that with the school environment. And it's, it, it's almost an interesting contradiction to Mark to the values that we're teaching in our health education classes of nutrition and well-being surrounding food. And the fact that our, our schools are serving these, these products is something that, you know, as a committee, we felt was in direct contradiction. So we really try to touch, touch on that in here with a bigger picture than necessarily sodas, but to touch on all sugary drinks and the advertising and the, and the whole bigger picture of, of food in our schools. Thanks. That's very helpful, and I'm glad we could bring that out. Um, and we're, as you know, very engaged in that topic, um, and so hopefully we can continue to engage with you over the coming year. Um, and then on um, HRAC, I did want to make a point um, when you're talking about um, how we are publicizing uh, various programs. Um, you probably aren't aware of this, uh, but the board's education summit, which annually occurs in the fall, um, is actually going to be addressing those kind of different paths that student can, students can take. And so I'm hopeful that we can take your recommendation to do a one-pager um, and incorporate that as part of the summit. Thank you. Good thinking. Um, okay, Mr. Velkoff, to be followed by Mr. Stork. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize to all of you, and especially to Shaq, for uh, missing the first 45 minutes. Uh, I'm all in favor of holding our meetings in Korean for the reason that, first of all, uh, it, only two members would be speaking, and they happen to be our two speakers who are our members who are the briefest. Um, as, for, as for watching a movie uh, in Spanish with subtitles, um, I would go one step further and say, watch a movie in Spanish with no subtitles. It is hard. Right. Um, I think I was falling, uh, my attention was distracted when Mrs. Reed was saying something about the data that's available about the uh, effectiveness of FESEP. So um, I, I, I was going to ask that I know we're collecting data, but I don't know where it is and, and so forth. So if, if, if um, outside the meeting, you can inform me where to find this data. I would, I would certainly like to see that. And uh, just as one individual, I certainly wouldn't mind getting a presentation, uh, say, once a year on just, you know, what are we seeing longitudinally of the students that are coming through our pre-K program and as they go through uh, FCPS. Um, then, uh, Mrs. Burke, I want to thank you for, you mentioned, uh, being in touch with the church in Clifton. And uh, on the one hand, I, I've been feeling like I owed you an apology because I gave you nothing other than please go find out information about this um, but and really didn't follow up. But I actually want to say to Dr. Garza, I want to commend the staff and Mrs. Burke in, in particular for, frankly, not needing anybody 
to monitor and follow up and just know that you can say, go investigate this and, and something happens. So I, th I think um, it's an example of the professionalism of our staff and you can be very proud of them. Um, okay. Ms. Mask, I, I came in the middle of your presentation, so I'm sorry I missed the beginning of it, but the part that I heard was um, very moving and uh, very touching, and it's a demonstration of um, how important it is for parents to be involved for their students, to be caring about the education of their students, to be caring about the raising of their students, and. Um, it, it, you know, it, yours was a, a wonderful story and example to many. I, I hope we can replicate your experience uh, throughout the county. Um, I want to talk about a little further about issues of uh, helping parents, and I'm I'm going to leave a. Um, no, I think I better I, I better stay focused. So I'll forget that. Um, <clears throat> So there, there are really sort of two classes of um, parents that I, I see us needing to reach. And the first class, I think, it sounds like we have a lot of good things in place, but they need to keep, and of course we need to keep building on them. And that is the parents who, like Ms. Mask, are involved in their, in their kids' education. They care about um, what their kids are going to be when they grow up, and they're hungry for resources and help to make sure that happens. And those children are, you know, they're probably going to turn out all right because the parents are involved. Um, the harder problem, and it's a problem for our society, for the county, for our community, is not all parents are that involved. And it's not placing blame on anybody about anything, but the, the consequences for those students is, of course, disastrous. And it's disastrous for all of us, right? And so, you know, you're welcome to comment or you're welcome to sit back and, you know, realize that this is a very tough nut. But um, I, I think the, the really hard problem for us as a society is how do we help those kids, right? Mr. Moon mentioned having a mentor, right? And um, I think at the Hispanic Leadership Association, Dr. Garza and I heard some stories from students who had overcome incredible things. And the common theme was there was, there was some one or two adults in their lives, whether it was in the home, in the school, or somewhere else. And again, how do you scale that up? Right, the, the instances where the kids find that support, they succeed. But as a society, how do we deal with those kids who aren't lucky enough to find those people? So I um, did mention that I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And for me, unfortunately, I did have a parent that wasn't as involved, not necessarily because she just didn't want to be, but she was also a single mother and there were six of us. And, you know, at, at that point, there, there, you, you have priorities, you know, how involved, okay, I could go to every single event at school and check everybody's homework and all of that, or I could work and put food on the table for everybody. Um, and for me, as a, ch as a child growing up, it wasn't necessarily that, well, I will say I, I had a principal who was very involved. My principal literally went and looked at the rising seniors at my high school. She looked at the, at our, I went to a very small high school, 600 kids. I know it's not possible in everyone. Um, but she looked at everybody's schedule. She looked at all the students who were doing well, who took at least took, you know, I was in AP classes and honors classes and she saw that I was in North Carolina in order to qualify to be an NC scholar, I needed to take a certain number of certain types of classes. I needed to take one more science class. She literally changed my schedule without me knowing until the first day of school <laughs> to, and added that X sheet. She took a teacher, a couple of teachers and put an anatomy class into our high school so that we could learn anatomy and achieve that requirement to actually get that 
that NC scholar um, and add it to our, our transcripts to better our chances for college. And to me, that was kind of, I mean, that was pivotal, obviously. Um, but not only was it something like that in terms of like the lengths, the great lengths that she went to to make sure that, that people had that opportunity, but it was also just the fact that she was constantly pushing it. Constantly. I lived in an area that was a little, that was a lot smaller than this one, so I actually had come in contact with her at a middle school before. She, she was a middle school teacher, and I went to a middle school that she was teaching at, and then she went into administration and became a principal. But she was just a person who was overly enthusiastic about learning and about school and about children making it and going to college and, and furthering their education. And I'm lucky enough to have had one of those people in my life, and I feel like that is what should be the focus. Not necessarily spending tons of money on like innovation, of course that's great, and new ideas, and how else do we reach people, but actually keeping things consistent and constant so that when you do have children that are able to be reached, they have that there. Not, oh, you know, we had this, we ran it for about five years, and it wasn't as successful as we hoped, so we're gonna try something else. I, I think keeping the, the resources constant and the people there who are enthusiastic about these things and the programs that are helping kids, keeping them there is, is what's important because at home they don't have that consistency with a parent who's not as involved for one reason or another. Usually in, in households like that, there's not a lot of stability or consistency in general. So having something that is a constant in their life, even if it's just to get them comfortable enough to come out and say something to somebody is, is very important. I was to add to that, <clears throat> excuse me, all the research indicates that all families want their children to succeed. It's just having different uh, understandings of what family engagement look and sound like. And it, it can't be so much that, that we only look at parents coming to the school to, look, to think of them as being engaged or involved in their child's education. Um, and for many of our families coming from so many different cultures, they aren't expected to be a part of their, their child education in other countries. And so when they come to us, are we engaging them, reaching out to them in their communities? Are we def defining for them what family engagement looks and sounds like here in the United States? Answering their questions and then building their sense of self-efficacy that they can do this amidst everything else that they're facing. Um, and then like, again with the consistency, continually engaging them throughout the school year, it's this child's school career. Um, I think that's essential. Um, we also have a part of our program, our, um, some of our staff are early childhood specialists and they're all paired with um, classrooms across the county and they do exactly what Karen mentioned. They reach out to families, they go to them, they work, they um, connect with them in their home, develop relationship and then begin to create that bridge to the school for those maybe more disenfranchised families that whether it's a language barrier or um, experiences in their own school that is preventing them from um, joining. Some of the struggle is is we do a great deal but it's one year. And one year can make a big difference for some families, but not for all families. And then if they don't go to a school that um, has pieces that, like a Title I school, then sometimes it's easy for them to get lost and, and, um, and not be as connected. And we advocate exactly, as Karen said, something as simple as checking your child's back, backpack and seeing what's in there is a, a part of being involved in your child's education. I can add that we, we approached family and community involvement in almost every s subject that we dealt with. <clears throat> and obviously it, it's of massive importance to the success of the students in the school system. And, but we also challenged ourselves to, to think about, for better or for worse, the situations that are off the charts in the other direction where, where students, you know, there are homeless students in our system. There are, uh, you know, students from the most awful home situations. And it's, I think, an e it may be an easy way to, one of the easier areas uh, to, to think about this in is, is with school food. And we hear a lot of debate back and forth about the chocolate milk or not, or, you know, choices and healthy eating and education needs to be supported at home. And, and we acknowledge all of that. But we also challenged ourselves to think about, you know, the 45,000 children in Fairfax County Public Schools who are on free and reduced lunch. And some of them may only eat one meal a day. Some of them may only eat one 
meal over the weekend. I mean, there, there are programs that put food into kids' backpacks so they can ha actually just have food. So I think we, we, in addition to recognizing the importance of family and community involvement and what we could do, we also wanted to make sure that we addressed baseline criteria that would affect every student positively, no matter what their home environment might be, and give them all the same opportunities. Just, uh, I want to just reiterate and ditto what everyone has said. Just two quick points. One is you'll find in our report language to the effect of what you just mentioned, that every student will have at least one trusted adult within the school community that they can go to and, and, and speak with, whether we call them a mentor or whatever we call them is not important. So that's the one piece, that, that is critical. Uh, the second piece is, and I think I, you mentioned it earlier, I remember early in my career we would have, I would have parent coffees and then I would go back to my office dejected because only five parents showed up. So what, what I think we need to do now is not so much uh, wait on parents to come to us, we have to go to them. And I think that the, the parent liaison is critical um, in that endeavor. make one last comment. We have um, also neighborhood readiness um, teams that are going out into the community to, again, create that transition for children as they go into kindergarten. And of the 10 schools involved, um, the community and the school staff are doing some wonderful things. Something as simple as going to a community room in a neighborhood to do kindergarten orientation as opposed to uh, having families come into the school. So again, starting that relationship um, in a different environment that then can be bridged into the school. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Belkov. I did want to mention just one thing. I think in the report, um, the FESAP Head Start report, there, there are some charts in one of the attachments that I think show, yeah, and I know like, like everybody else in Fairfax County, we, we have too much on our plate, so you may not have seen that, but there are some charts showing some of the longitudinal results, so if you want, if there's not enough there, you know, we'll, um, okay. Um, all right, I have Mr. Stork next. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with FISA Head Start. Um, it's a program that's, uh, I dearly love and was actually an administrative Head Start program. I think I t say this every year because I'm proud of it. And, and I am. I mean, we made a real difference with kids, and, and we had lots of family. And, and I was in the same building most of the time during the time I was administrator with, so I'd hear kids running around yelling and screaming. So that's always kind of an energizing part of your life. So it's, you never get tired of that. And, and the, the parents and, and the teachers and the people involved with those programs were just deeply committed and involved and connected to to the kids needing that help. And this was, as you might imagine, many, many, many years ago. Uh, not in the first Head Start class it ever was, but not too much after that. So it, I'm sure, I know that it's changed. It was half day program then, so it's three or four hours a day then, and, but you, you still have the core of what you have now, which is the, the parents uh, were a core part of that whole process. The education is mutual, you know, parents and kids and so forth. So thank you very much for the work you're doing, and it is something that we deeply care about, I know, on this board, and if we had a way to find some additional money, we know that we would be putting it there because we, we greatly value what it does for our kids and how it helps level the playing field, and we know we have serious issues with the playing field not being leveled uh, when children get to kindergarten. So thank you. Um, I, I um, had a couple questions on the Title I. I don't, I'm not familiar with the family engagement leaders. I was hoping maybe you could guide me a little bit more, explain to me. I mean, it sounds like a wonderful concept, connecting with the home, the court, you know, our central office here and mm -hmm. kind of being connection points, but help me understand that and as how it really as works in schools. Sure. Uh, this is a new initiative this school year. Each of our Title I schools, and then the opportunity was expanded to PSI non-Title I non-Title I schools. That's particularly got my attention was the PSI yes. program. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking for ways that we could really embed family engagement into schools practices throughout the school year and how they can support uh, uh, academic goals within the school improvement plan. Uh, two family engagement leaders at least. Some schools sent me lists of ten or more names. So they formed actual teams of family engagement action teams at their schools who were not only points of contact for the Title I office, for the Family and School Partnerships office, Etc. in terms of 
resources and supports not only to make sure that uh, schools were aware of, but that they can then share and implement in their schools themselves. Um, we have seen growth in the number of parent workshops, awareness of different family literacy, early literacy programs, and bringing those into the schools. Um, lots of collaboration amongst Title I family engagement leaders in terms of practices that, that they're implementing. So they get together regularly then outside of the school yes. environment in the school? We initially yeah. talked about having quarterly collaborative sessions and it ended up being monthly, which has been an interesting experience wow. for me. Uh, <laughs> So October through uh, May, well, I actually have offered an, an optional time to get together at the end of it, June or mid-June um, that they requested a time to get together and really plan for next school year. Mm, that's uh, there's, It's a lot. I think once we open up the, the doors to collaboration, it, it's just as it's spread. Each month we had a certain topic. So we talked about family empowerment. We talked about engaging fathers. Um, in family engagement around STEM or STEAM. And then just lots, not only did we share resources, but then they shared what they were doing in their schools and how they were getting the information to families. Um, when we talked about family empowerment, we heard a lot about Sleepy Hollow Elementary School, which hosts its PTA meetings in the Wilson Community Center because they don't have a bus stop near them. They don't have a sidewalk. And then they also host it simultaneously online through Blackboard Collaborate. And then afterwards, it becomes a parent focus group. So a lot of families who can walk to the Wilson Community Center, frequently the underserved parents, parent population can then have their principal's attention for about an hour or so and just ask all sorts of questions and really become leaders and advocates. And so hearing those stories has really been um, well received from the schools. Particular takeaway in terms of this, you're now getting ready to go into, I assume, your, your second year of this, and any particular changes that you might make or you're looking to make based upon your first year's experience? Uh, more collaboration with the different offices. Uh, I, I sit different in more offices, you mean the central office? or Central offices, okay. yes. Uh, more and I sit on the FCPS Family Engagement Committee, which consists of different central office members who coordinate a variety of family engagement programs, including DSS, uh, Family School Partnerships. We have neighborhood and community services from Family Fairfax County who come and join, mm -hmm. different library organizations and just making sure that we're aware of what's available to families and to schools to, to support their efforts. And so bringing this program to the committee to identify more professional development for schools, more resources to share with them and opportunities to, to continue to grow. That, that's gonna be our next step. Well, I know I was particularly pleased, one of my, my, um, my favorite uh, school board goals, we have three student achievement goals. Second one is uh, essential life skills and I mean, as you can see up there, it's, and you all, I know have made that a major mm -hmm. part of your focus, which to me is, is exactly the core of what we need to, to build a relationship with parents as well as kids. And we're all working together for the same outcome, which is kids have those as base kind of ways, behaviors, et cetera, for interacting with the world around them. So very pleased to see that. I, engaging fathers was interesting. I hope if there's anything new that, or that you found particularly valuable, useful, please share that with us. I know that's one of our major Absolutely. challenges. I don't know if you have anything that, that fits that, but we, we, we struggle, I know, every day with that, and we always welcome other ideas and approaches for, for doing that. Sure. Uh, we have uh, lots of, of resources that I can share with the school board. Um, Lots of conversation centered around the, the visuals and the messages that we send without realizing we're sending messages to fathers when we're really in sending invitations to moms or the, the brochures are all pictures of, of children with their moms or their grandmothers. And it's, there really should be recognition that fathers have a, a equal um, importance in their child's learning and reaching out to fathers and providing opportunities for fathers that, that are more welcoming or engaging to, to their needs and, and, and making sure that we're offering um, opportunities out in the community as well. Uh, I, having, finding male leaders within the school or the community to help start programs such as Brenmar Park, which has a men of Brenmar Park group where they have a male teacher who coordinates those efforts and they've done fantastic things I know, Sandy, you've been involved in that, that organization, and, and they've, um, they've done great things with the school playground, which was covered with trailers at one point and not, didn't really provide a real 
recess space for children and, and really were essential in getting that kind of reorganized to free up that space for, for children. Uh, thank you. I know I've probably spent my time. I have just, just two themes I want to come back to. First and foremost, I want to thank uh, the human relations folks. I think you're, you should continue on your charge. I think you made some excellent progress this year. I'm particularly interested in the communication piece that you reference, and if you want to make any comments about that, you're welcome to, but I, I, I know we have more, more engagement there and maybe simplifying and some of the, the web things that we can do related to that. I, I, I share all that. I know, and I'm sure Ms. Hines does too, is chairing of our, uh, of our committee, the public engagement committee. So I, I think we know that we need to adopt and I'm sure the report will be helpful in that regard to them. And then for, for Shaq, uh, I, I think the question I have there is using SHAC to involving, to increasing our, our communication and community outreach. I didn't, I saw that in your report and I didn't know if you had something specific. I know you've done that already with a lot of the food nutrition things that have happened this year. The wellness plan is another way of and, and engaging the schools in, in the, um, the golden wellness award that we give out, et cetera. So I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add, but those are kind of my last comments. So thank you all very much. Um, yeah, the the idea behind in, in involving Shaq in the wellness policy, um, I mean, we anything that's going to be in the wellness policy is going to be something that Shaq might address in the future. Um, everything that we do is has to be made available to the public. We represent every magisterial district and other community um, interests, and um, the new federal requirements specifically ask that local districts allow the public to participate, assess, you know, uh, make recommendations, um, and so there, it would be an easy way to be a vehicle to help facilitate that information back and forth. I mean, even though it's just an advisory committee, it would be a platform, and it already is, for the community to comment and, be, and participate in school health and wellness, and that's what the legislation wants. Um, Yes, in, in terms of the communication piece, I just wanted to say, first I wanted to uh, give kudos to the communication subcommittee because they did an awful lot of research in terms of combing through FCPS to look at what already is in place and to also look at the areas in which we could enhance our communications or do something different to try to better our communications. We have, uh, we have about eight languages in which most, most or all things are translated. However, that, that comes out to about 82% of the population within FCPS, so that, ought to, that alone leaves us with about, what, 12% of the people that we are not reaching at all. So, I mean, at least that's a place to start. And what we were hoping to do was not so much come up with answers, but to start looking at some questions and raise some questions. Thank you. Um, I have Ms. Smith next. I think one of the most enjoyable things about this evening is, is really hearing about all the wonderful things we're doing and the impacts they have on people. But a couple of things, you know, hearing about parents walking 10 blocks to get to the school after they get off the bus in this issue, one of the things one of the supervisors talked about was how can we use public transportation to get kids to school? Well, I ask the question, how can we use public transportation to get parents to school? And sometimes we're not coordinate, coordinating enough with needs, but I'm, I think this needs to be on our radar, that, that as we talk with that with the supervisors, we have to help parents be able to get to the schools too. Not to say we don't want to get in their communities, that's powerful, but how can we make that easier? So thank you for bringing that up. That was a new thing for me to hear. Okay, thank you. Um, I know we have one go back, and I know that Dr. Garza would like to say a few things. I want to just take a moment myself um, to thank you all again and ask you a few questions. Um, on Head Start FESEP, I did want to clarify maybe um, the, the school board voted to try to add two new yeah. classrooms for next fall, depending on space, yeah. right? But then, yeah, right? Uh, but then uh, the school system had already decided to try to use the Title I money to add two. So we may have as many as four new classrooms mm -hmm. this exactly. fall. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're often asking ourselves, what can we do um, that doesn't cost money, right? And I think there are a few things. Uh, that we, we can do better uh, that don't 
necessarily cost money, at least at the front end. And one of them is when we talk about the CIP, our, our capital improvement program, we don't even mention um, Head Start classrooms. We don't mention early education, you know, in our priorities. I mean, I, we haven't even talked about it. And so as far as I know, it's not part of our conversation. So I think we should add that into our conversation um, of our priorities for the CIP. Also, it seems to me, um, in my understanding, that when um, in, in places where the, the need for early education has been met, um, it seems to happen where the state has taken a strong leadership role and done a lot of funding. And I think of some of the places like Oklahoma um, and other places where you see great things being done. Um, I really think it requires that push from the state level. Um, and when we know that we have issues with Virginia Preschool Initiative and the, the match, the local match, and how much money is left on the table every year. Um, so I think, again, that's something. It is in our legislative package. It's one of our priorities. But I think it's something we have to continue to push for at the state level is just more a priority on that. And also to engage the business community. This is something we've started to talk about with our new foundation director, you know. Um, and so I, I think that's something that together between the board and the staff, we can put together something um, to get, a, get that support from the business community as well. Um, uh, so I didn't really have any questions for you. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Um, on human resources, Mr. Pan, I was wondering, I, I, I read in your report that um, your charge, I mean, I mean, it is very wide, <laughs> and it's broad, and it's, you know, uh, and I sensed from reading the report that maybe you might like, a, that the, commu the committee might like a little more focus going forward for the next year. Did I read that right? Or Yes, that's correct. And let me just, let me just qualify. 82 and 18 is 100. I really do know that. So it's 18 percent. <laughs> okay. But no, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we thought that this year the the focus should be uh, looking at looking at the diversity, looking at the student diversity, and then looking looking at the diverse needs because the needs, the diversity, and the needs are just as great as the diversity of the population. So so it was it was very difficult for us to even begin the process to learn where where do we take this what do we do with this and that's why we said up front that this may be a two or three year charge rather than a one year so this year we were really just hoping to kind of um, explore and raise some questions i'm sorry just want to just want to add to that that we've also been talking to eer about being a sounding board for the bullying policies. So one of the things that the committee talked about, um, kind of a subgroup about you know, ideas for charges earlier was making sure we didn't spread ourselves too thin on both those topics. So as much as there's follow-up, it would really help if there was something very precise to go after um, as a follow-up to what we've already presented and still give us bandwidth to help with the, um, the bullying reporting that's gonna be going on. Okay, so I hear that the, the bullying is, is a focus you'd like to continue with. Did you have, did you have a sense from the committee of anything else within your chart that you really feel like the committee is ready to have as a, a stronger focus this next year? Well, um, I, I think that communication piece was really important because it was a theme that came over. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that we came out is that there's so much available, um, even for those individuals that are part of the system, they were overwhelmed. And so we work backwards to people who aren't professionally part of the system, and then working back from there to people who are new to the system or people who don't have the language skills. And it can be overwhelming. And maybe too much um, is, is in some ways great for reaching out, but it might be drowning us, and we're missing the important messages. Um, as far as the topic of bullying, I, I think there's been with to do both. There's the, just the concern that we want to make sure we stay focused enough to deliver a reasonable report. Yeah. Sexual harassment. Oh, do you? Harassment. Sexual harassment. I, I hear you. Yes, and we also had brought up the concept of talking a little bit about sexual harassment so that it wasn't uh, inadvertently rolled into the topic of bullying and that it gets the uh, separation on a peer to peer level that it would deserve. Okay, thank you. I can tell that that was something that m members of the committee felt strongly about, so it will be something that you talk about. Right, right. 
Well, good. I, and I hope that um, I hope you're able then to um, get you know get a focus that you feel comfortable with for the next year. I mean, it sounds like you've done a lot of thinking about it. Yeah, as a matter as a matter of fact, before this meeting today, um, members of HRAC met upstairs to talk about the charge for next year and to start trying to focus uh, in terms of you know what can we spe specifically look at and specifically deliver because we knew that the charge this year unlike the charge last year that the report is not as detailed because we really did want to explore so yes we are hoping to to really come up with something f for next year's charge that we can really specifically look with more depth Okay, thank you. We look forward to that. And my last question, I wanted to ask Ben um, on SHAC. Um, thank you for your service to the committee this year. Um, and I was just wondering from a student's perspective, I know that um, SHAC's charge was pretty ambitious as well, you know, and you, you didn't finish it all, right? I know we can see that in the report. Um, and so I was wondering from a student's perspective, what do you think is maybe the most important thing to do next? So I think we've got a whole lot of issues that we have to look at. Obviously, we were all deeply touched this year by the tragedies that touched us at Woodson and Langley. Um, and that's something as a student community we've all really felt strongly about. And we've come forward and realized that we're under a lot of stress, that we're under a lot of pressure from school and the community at large, and that we need to develop coping strategies. To deal, to deal with that. So as a charge for next year, I would, you know, we've discussed uh, potentially investigating the more mental health, more mental wellness, specifically relating to student stress and coping strategies. Um, I have to advocate it, but uh, start times are certainly something that the student community feels very strongly about. Some, uh, some feel that they shouldn't go into effect, some, some do. It's a very, you know, very diverse uh, range of opinion. But I think the most important thing that we have to look at is just how students feel about, about what's happening. Because it's very easy for um, this board to make decisions, but getting the student feedback on, on the implications of every policy that goes into effect is really important, uh, especially regarding health. Uh, stuff like food, obviously, is very important. But I think just you know, engaging in conversation with, the, with this board on how we can really get the whole student health piece moving. And I want to commend the board for um, allowing the community to engage in the um, summit on stress, uh, summit on teen stress that Dr. Dockery and uh, no, I just wanted to speak briefly because the um, your board group that you had, yeah, I can even stand up and do this. <laughs> um, sorry, um, but because of that group, um, your in your your interns that you had. Um, Cognito, which has the product for teachers, is developing a product for students, and we've reached out to them, and they may be letting our students pilot or give feedback on the product. So we, we were planning to bring that back to the interns. So um, that's an area that they want to continue to be involved in, that we have an opportunity for them to pilot for the nation. So. Thank you, Dr. Doctor, and thank you, Ben. Anytime we really get the voice of the student in our conversation, we do much better work. So I really appreciate that. Go back to Mr. Moon. Just, just want to make one quick comment. I want to give my strong endorsement and concurrence to uh, the needs, the importance of needs to reach out to the uh, communities, going to the communities for, especially those who uh, find challenges in coming to our, you know, coming into the schools. Uh, I, 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 I bet that the staff and, and the school community you know, have been looking into this already and already doing this, but uh, many of these language minority parents uh, or some members of faith community, uh, I don't know whether it's a legal inhibition for us to be able to reach out to the faith communities, especially on weekend like Sundays, but that's where I see a lot of those parents congregate for, and that's where you know we might tap into, and and also you know on Saturday there are many Saturday schools, you know for the Chinese community I know that there is a one, uh, there are you know several several campuses in Fairfax County, but you know two thousand strong you know sh students you know, going to a language school, Chinese language school on Sundays. Uh, that's, a, that's, you know, places where we can go and, and provide the support they need. 
Thank you. Good point. Dr. Garza, did you want to give us our last word? <laughs> Wow, this pressure since the last word. So I think what I'll do is just make a few comments. And, and um, first of all, I'll just, I have to say this is a perfect example of the many great partnerships we have in our school system that make us very proud, all of us very proud. Uh, the synergies that are created when you have great staff. We have wonderful people all throughout the system. And I thank the community members who've made reference to that support and partnership. Um, and the fact that we have such caring, dedicated community parent members who are willing to give up time. I, I look at, at some of you at the end of the table, and I know you serve on more than one committee. And uh, we meet a lot uh, on other things as well, not just this committee that you're talking about tonight. So it's a real... Um, even so much more that we can do. And your story is very in inspiring. Um, you have a bright career ahead of you. you. So, and then Ben, my goodness, we were over here, you saw us talking. We weren't talking about you, we were admiring. And just, I was actually thinking about your parents. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> They've done very well. And maybe we had a small part to play in that. But And what high school do you go to? I'm at Madison. I'm in Miss Hines District in Vienna. Madison High School. Madison I know his High father school. pretty well. <laughs> um, any one of these topics, um, I, I could go on probably and just really want to pick your brains and dig in a little deeper. And But let me just touch on some high points. And maybe you all can come back later on it or maybe make it part of your conversations and in looking towards next year. Um, so just a, a few things. Um, what you were saying earlier, uh, I'd really love to, I mean, we're seeking solutions and very concerned around the mental health and overall well-being of our students. I loved your report, thought you had a lot of great things that we can certainly benefit uh, from as we move forward, but I would love your specific ideas around, you know, what we can do to, to better support, because I've talked with a lot of people about that. I've looked at other school systems across the country, and um, I think we're striving to find some solutions. And, and as was pointed out earlier, if anyone can figure that out, uh, we can. Um, the communications challenges, uh, I certainly appreciate it uh, uh, and understand that and something that we, we are challenged with. Um, so I, I appreciate the specific feedback. Uh, CTE, multiple pathways. Um, we, we, we have an opportunity to develop, I, I think, more than one pathway as a model to high school diploma. I think there's some readiness for that at the state level, to your, to your point, Mr. McElveen, in terms of a white paper and how we guide that conversation. Um, your, the committee's um, recommendation around maybe we have too many programs, um, I thought was very enlightening. And I think what, maybe what you were, were describing is maybe too much noise, right? Lots and lots of great programs, but maybe so much that it's hard for people to find their way. So maybe next year you, you all uh, love to hear your ideas about maybe about what, because we often have this conversation, what could be taken off the plate. So just note for your committee. Early childhood. Oh, my goodness. I could go on this one never. Um, the number, do you think it's more around the 1,395? Check it every day. It varies a little because children leave, right. different ones come in. So when we um, did this report uh, probably about a month ago now, maybe six weeks, um, that, that's what it was countywide. So it included who, the children who sit on the wait list at the community um, had start and VPI programs as well. Okay. Uh, 1,475 being served. I'm going to remember that number. Um, I have a speech next week. I'm going to talk about this. Um, not I, I being served. Those are the kids not being served. I'm sorry. Did I? Is that what you were saying? No, no I think. Being served. Oh, 400. 1, I'm sorry. I was looking at the. I thought you were talking about the wait list. Yes. So that is our number. That is right. The head start in the public schools. I'm sorry. Okay. My number, my number was right, yes. though. And, okay, good. Because I don't want to lie. And that's the community. Okay. Okay. I, I think that um, it's very obvious this board and this leadership team, this school community, very much supports uh, the need for us to serve every child. 
you know, giving every child um, the equal life chance. And I think it starts in, in giving them an equal uh, platform going into kindergarten ready for school, ready to learn. I think what we need is a, a map of our needs. I need a map. I need, I need FCPS, the county, Fairfax County, and I need to know where our needs are strategically because I think we can come up with solutions. I think the real challenge I have is we're not specific about what the need is. And so we add classrooms here and there, and I, I mean, I agree so much with this board about that's one, you know, there's 20 kids maybe that we're making a difference with, but we need a strategic approach uh, there. I think we also have to look at, I appreciate uh, your comments around a quality program, and I think that always has to be what we're focused on, but I do think quality can look different. I think there could be a myriad of options because I don't know that we're gonna be able to do it the same way in all places. So I think we're gonna have to have s some different models kind of a, um, you know, a continuum of services. Uh, and I think we've seen that work service well. Not this, it, this is the same, but it's a little bit like it, that bridge to kindergarten, right? Helps us, helps me to need, not perfect, but it helps get, get us there. The research, wow, I was very captivated by the research. What I need <laughs> is summed. So what do we? What is the real takeaway from the data? Because I love the cohort analysis. I think that could be very, very compelling if we said, just from our own students. I mean, we know what the research says out there in, the, in across the nation. I can I can quote that. But to say that we have analysis right here in Fairfax County where we follow cohort groups of students, and this is the number. This is what the difference it makes. So. So I would, I would ask if you could synthesize what I thought was a great report. I was, I was pretty enamored with it. So, and I'm not talking about anything elaborate. We, we, I always have to say this to people here because everyone is like high overachievers. I'm talking two or three bullets that are the takeaways. I, have, I, I, I find that I have to be very explicit. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want a dissertation. Just three, you know, kind of what? Yeah, probably. You know, just three points that we could. You know, that we could. Because I think that resonates. Take it out to the community and tell them our story. Um, so anyway, that's great. Title one. My goodness, I loved how you all talked about kind of flipping the perspectives in in a couple of examples you gave. I. I, I, I Good for you. I am very impressed with that and in the story and just the work. Again, all of you, I could go on and on about. Uh, and then find my find, just my final quick comment because I'm between us leaving, is as you, as you think about committee charges for next year, because I certainly um, was listening to what you were saying about um, it's a, you're kind of passionate about lots of different things, right? To me, that's what was illustrated by because you talked about this and that and that. I mean, you're passionate about it. Uh, I would, I would ur urge focus because there are other committees doing similar kinds of work. We really want to maximize your time and energy. So I'd say, you know, be spe specific as you can. Um, and then I'd say stay tuned because there's, this is a very uh, exciting uh, and critical place for our school system right now. We're beginning to contemplate uh, the direction of our school system. What are we going to look like in the future? So I would say stay tuned to what the board's going to be um, starting in earnest. It's already started, but really with the board in earnest in these next few meetings about our priorities for the future for our school system, I think all of, my goodness, the capacity and the talent and passion um, of these advisory committees can be very helpful as we identify the priorities and really you know, charge you to help us you know, put the meat to all of that. So I'd say stay tuned on that. Um, I, I hope that we can engage you further as we identify these priorities. And I just am, am very grateful uh, for your commitment of time, energy, and support, uh, and certainly, most importantly, your advocacy for children. Thank you. So once again, on behalf of the board, thank you so much, and take the rest of the day off. <laughs>